Okay, folks, thank you all very much for coming out this morning on this beautiful Saturday morning when you could be doing other things like going up the mountain or off the coast or who knows where to uh, hear about this topic that nobody in Marin cares about, wildfires. <laughs> I'm Greg Brockbank. I'm the program director this year for the Environmental Forum's Lecture Series 2014. Um, this is lecture number three of the four we're doing this year. We've already covered uh, fracking in California and sea level rise, and uh, uh, today, as I mentioned, is wildfires, and the uh, final of the four series this year, uh, land use and transportation. Uh, and of course, there's always more information on the Environmental Forum's website, marinefm.org, also on the uh, bookmark. I'd like to introduce a few people, um, particularly uh, the board members. First, I'd like to introduce the president of the board of the Environmental Forum, we're in Sarah Kelly. Will you r raise your hand? Or <laughs> terrific. Also, I would be remiss if I did not mention uh, three particularly revered members of the Environmental Forum, two of our founders who are all continue to be very active and regular, Nona Dennis and <laughs> Phyllis Faber. Where's Phyllis? And Kathy Cuneo. Sorry. I'll get to Kathy in a minute because she's also one of the day's coordinators. But I also wanted to mention our immediate past president of the board, Vicki Rupp, is here somewhere. There she is, Vicki. Thank you. Actually, we have so many stars here, people that have been coordinators of last sessions. I better, I better stop before I uh, leave somebody out, which I've already done. Too late. Uh, I think we had some elected officials at times. In fact, uh, Claire McAuliffe had signed up. I didn't see her today. She's been to one or two of the last sessions, the uh, City Council of Belvedere. I, I, maybe she hasn't made it yet today, but I uh, want to uh, make a disclaimer. The Environmental Forum, as an organization, remains neutral on issues and does not take positions on issues. Please note that everything you hear tonight is not the direct opinion of the Environmental Forum of Marin. And now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce the three co-coordinators of this morning's session and turn it over to them to introduce the speakers. First, Kathy Cuneo. Uh, as part of the group, Kathy uh, taught in the first three years of the Audubon Canyon Ranch Docent Program and the first three years of the, environment, the Marin Forum for Environmental Quality, uh, called at that time the Forum. She has been active as the board president of the Environmental Forum of Marin, program director, forum master class and co-coordinator of plant communities and Baylands days for the past 15 years. Uh, Kathy has studied fire ecology as part of her PhD program in environmental planning at UC Berkeley. She continues to be an active board member. I mentioned a revered co-founder and also, important role that she's probably too modest to put in here, she is the coordinator mentor, which means she's in charge of all the people that put on each of these programs. So that's arguably the most important role. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> Next co-coordinator for today is Kate Powers. Kate Powers has been a member of the forum since 1999. She has co-coordinated topics for both the lecture series and the master class. Master class has been going on for just over 40 years. The lecture series about 10. Uh, the number of classes vary, but uh, keep checking them out. They're, more and more we're getting uh, what I like to call repeat business because the information bears repeating, because the topics change, and because we all can't remember everything perfectly the first time we hear it. <laughs> Uh, Kate Powers is an assistant director of master, uh, of master Class 41, which will be starting this fall. And again, another reason we want your email addresses is to send you updates on the Master Class. Traditionally, they have always been starting in fall and running till sometime in the spring, uh, all day, most of the day, Tuesdays. And I've always called it a 200-hour uh, hands-on infield uh, environmental training course, the likes of which has, is offered nowhere else in Marin or practically really anywhere else. And so if you really want to learn about Marin and the natural world for which we advocate, that's our new motto, uh, and educate, uh, the master class is the way to go. These are all wonderful lectures for people that are too busy to spend most Tuesdays for several months, but uh, do attend the master class if you possibly can starting this fall. Uh, did I finish Kate? Uh, Kate's uh, dad was a firefighter for several years in Mendocino. Finally, final co-coordinator for today, Christina Waldeck is a resident of Mill Valley and a graduate of the Environmental Forum of Marin Class 27. Christina and husband Ken, who will be speaking today, were recently honored with an award for good citizenship by the Tamalpais Community Services District for their work on fire safety. Without further ado, let me introduce and please welcome Kathy Cuneo. 
you very much. Today, our first two speakers, Mike Swayze, Watershed Resources Manager for the Marin Municipal Water District, and Linda Dahl, Director and General Manager for Marin County Parks and Marin County Open Space Districts, will describe to you how their agencies work together to um, protect the resources of the county. They will describe how, while recognizing fire as an important ecological agent of disturbance, they are planning and managing to minimize the occurrence of wildfire at the urban wild, uh, wildland interface. Jason Weber, right there, the fire chief of Marin County, will describe how the county of Marin, under his guidance, takes a systems approach to fire protection. And forum members, Ken Waldeck and Christine Waldeck, will take you through the steps their neighborhood took to make it safer. So that's a general overview of our day. And now I'll start and introduce Mike. Mike leads manage, uh, land management and natural resources, visitor facilities, and public safety on Marin Municipal Water District's nearly 22,000 acres of watershed lands. He began his MMWD career in 1995, spearheading the implementation of the district's Mount Tamalpais Vegetation Management Plan with its twin goals of protecting biodiversity and reducing fire hazards. Mike is currently the president of Fire Safe Marin, a nonprofit organization dedicated to reducing the wildland fire hazards and improving fire safety awareness in Marin. Mike has a strong fire management background, including developing uh, vegetation management plans and directing prescribed burning uh, plan, uh, programs for forest restoration in the Lake Tahoe Basin State Park. Mike helped establish the Marin Conservation Corps, <coughs> now known as the Conservation Corps of North Bay in the early 1980s. He developed a fully uh, trained Corps member fire crew uh, in cooperation with the uh, Marin County Fire Department. Mike produced a comprehensive management plan for Marinwood CSD, uh, open space preserve, including provisions for fire hazard reduction. On April the 11th, the Marin Conservation League is awarding Mike their Marin Green Award for Environmental Leadership. Welcome, Mike. Well, I'm, uh, thank you for inviting me here. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about Marin's fire ecology. Uh, I do have a master's degree uh, in fire ecology, but it's only a master's degree, so the science only goes so deep. <laughs> and as my uh, professor uh, of ecology at Berkeley once said, ecology is the uh, overstatement of the obvious. <laughs> so, don't worry, it won't be uh, too daunting here. <laughs> Fire is the ultimate oxidizer. When uh, wood reaches about 300 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, heat decomposes some of the cellulose material that makes up wood. Some of the decompo decomposed material is released as volatile gases. Uh, we know these gases as smoke. Smoke is compounds of hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen. Um, here is a satellite image of last summer's rim fire. This was the third largest wildfire in California's history, having burned uh, 257,000 acres. And it is the biggest wildfire on record for the Sierra Nevada. A harbinger of the future. The actual burning of wood then happens in two separate reactions. When volatile gases are hot enough, about 500 degrees Fahrenheit, 
the compound molecules break apart and the atoms recombine with oxygen to form water, carbon dioxide, and other products. In other words, they burn. As they heat up, the rising carbon atoms, as well as the atoms of other material, emit light. And this is what causes the visible flame. So this is the fire triangle. This is the, one of the first thing that uh, firefighters learn in training because it explains two very important things. How do fires propagate? What are the elements that, that uh, fuel a fire? And how do, you, how, do you put them, how do you put a fire out? So by increasing any of the three uh, of the circles on the, the, the triangle, fuel, oxygen, and heat, you can uh, fan the fire. More fuel creates more intensity, uh, more oxygen in the form of wind, uh, uh, greater heat um, in terms of uh, possibly the temperature uh, can and, uh, create more, more fire intensity. So uh, you remove some of the legs, you reduce the fuel, you, uh, um, you uh, reduce the heat, you spread, separate the fuel from the, from the flame, uh, you, uh, you, you reduce the oxygen, uh, all of those things can put out a fire. The fire behavior triangle uh, takes the previous triangle, the fire triangle, and moves it to three dimensions in the real world. It describes how physical factors in our environment interact to uh, affect how wildfire spreads, spreads and how it, uh, int intensity of fire changes. So uh, this is really um, pretty key in understanding also how to, how to fight fires and also to maintain uh, firefighter safety. So uh, th these are the elements that uh, firefighters need to account for uh, in, in uh, developing strategies to suppress fires, but also these are the factors that help us figure out uh, where to do fuel modification. Um, but uh, topography uh, in Marin is steep in large part, so that fuels our, uh, our fire risk. We have heavy fuels throughout the county, and we have uh, particular weather conditions that promote uh, um, high fire risk. So here's a simple model of uh, how a uh, fire spreads, um, and this is, they don't actually um, look exactly like this. In fact, they rarely do. This is just a kind of a hypothetical model. But as fire spreads, uh, you know, it kind of responds to topography. Either there's a, there's a front of a fire and the back of a fire, um, and that can be the head of the fire could be the uphill end or the downwind section of the fire. That's what gives the fire uh, um, uh, its, its direction of movement. So the head of fire is the, is the leading edge that where the most of the intensity is. It's also the place where um, uh, that, um, fire brands can be uh, tossed forward and create spot fires. Uh, you'll see the flanks of the fire the, uh, where you have uh, both backing and heading. Uh, the, the back end of the fire, either downhill or downwind, is less intense. Um, so it's just kind of a, but as, as a fire spreads through, um, uh, you know, local topography, it's, it could have multiple heads and, uh, you know, have a very complex form. So a quick review of, uh, fire vocabulary. Uh, we, uh, we, we describe fires in, uh, their various forms. A ground fire is one that's, uh, burning in, in, uh, the, uh, in the duff layer. Uh, a surface fire is a fire that's traveling in the, uh, the, the down fuels and vegetation that's low to the ground. And crown fires is a condition where the, in forests where um, the fire is spreading uh, in, in the forest canopy or in the uh, a tall shrub canopy. Um, you need a strong wind and um, f uh, fuels in the understory to actually uh, maintain a crown fire. Torching is a when an individual tree or shrub uh, involves, uh, gets involved in, in, in the flame all at once. Uh, these, the head of a fire, as I said, has the opportunity to throw fire brands uh, a quarter mile, half mile, uh, sometimes even a full mile in front of the flaming front and creates uh, spot fires, which are really accelerates the spread of wildfires in their most intense form. You hear a lot of 
conversation about backing fire and backfires. Uh, uh, backfire is a, uh, a technique that's sometimes used to uh, light a fire uh, to uh, uh, take out fuels in front of a, a wildfire. Um, fuel breaks versus fire breaks. Fuel breaks are those things that are planned activities uh, that we have in wildlands next to uh, developed areas to reduce fuels. Fire breaks are those things that are constructed during fire suppression, uh, either by hand crews or by, by uh, bulldozers. Uh, ember showers are another uh, ignition source that happens during fires where uh, it rains uh, sparks down on, uh, on homes. Let's take a look at uh, Fire Through the Ages. Um, there's a great book in the back there, um, uh, Fire in America by uh, Stephen Pine. So if you really want to get into the, the really deep history of uh, fire in, in uh, North America, I recommend that, that book. Um, but it really talks about our relationship with fire, that it's been around uh, before there were humans, and then humans have had a long-lasting relationship with fire. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's been a widespread influence in all of um, the history of plants on the globe. Uh, and when humans came on the scene, we, we used fire for, for uh, warming, for cooking, and became adept at using it for cultural practices on the landscape. Um, but lightning has been the longstanding and most prevalent until the most, until the, the most recent decade, uh, centuries uh, lightning has been the most common uh, ignition source for fires. Other sources are uh, uh, lava, uh, rockfall, where sparks sometimes happen. Uh, there's been reported of trees rubbing together and uh, spontaneous combustion. There's all sorts of peculiar and odd sources of fire, but lightning has been uh, the most common. Uh, as I said, we've had fire in, on the globe for, uh, for eons, and in the plant world, uh, there's plenty of evidence for adaptation in relation to fire. Uh, in, in Marin, most of the woody plants are, uh, are sprouters. They, they, after a fire, they will respond, uh, various means of resprouting. Um, lots of plants, uh, their fire uh, re the regeneration stra strategy is to have uh, dormant seed banks in the soil. Uh, many trees have thick bark, like ponderosa pine and redwood trees. Uh, cone serotony, that's where cones that stay tight with their seeds, they need a fire, they need the heat of fire to open up and release seeds. Um, there's good evidence that heat and smoke germinate seed and uh, uh, lignotubers. I had to put that in there just to be able to say that. Lignotubers are like root crowns that uh, plants like manzanita have where uh, they, they can uh, re-sprout after a fire from them. Uh, fire is an ecological force. It is a huge reorganizer of, uh, of, of uh, natural systems. It can maintain uh, structures. It can... Um, um, push the restart button. So it depends on the vegetation type, but it, uh, it, it uh, has uh, profound impacts on, on uh, vegetation and therefore the ecosystems of our uh, world. It's an uh, awesome re nutrient recycler and a producer of carbon dioxide. Um, I want to introduce the uh, concept of fire regimes. This is the way fire ecologists kind of describe the, the fire scene in a particular area. Uh, it involves the intensity of the fire. Is it a, is it a light fire? Is it a, uh, a crown replace, uh, a stand replacing fire? Uh, are the fires small? Are they large? Do they happen um, in the spring or midsummer or fall? Um, how often do fires revisit a particular site? And what are the pattern of effects? So all those things, um, uh, go together to describe a fire regime. Um, we really want to look at Marin fire regimes since the last ice age uh, because that um, is the plant assemblages that we're living with now. And it also is the period of time where um, 
you know, uh, the first Americans uh, arrived and uh, brought the use of, uh, of uh, fire. Uh, lightning was present in, in Marin, uh, but it's, it's uh, uh, very infrequent. But in those days, there wasn't a county fire department, so a little bit of lightning ignition, uh, especially in the summer, went a long ways. It probably was persistent in the landscape and, and burned all over. But Ameri uh, the first Americans brought fire as a tool, and there's really good evidence of the frequent use of that. Uh, when European Americans arrived, we brought more fire. Uh, we brought more cattle grazing. Uh, now in the last century, we have a firefighting force that rivals the uh, armed forces of many nations uh, worldwide, um, and they've been really successful at putting out fires. However, uh, there's a paradox here. We've been so good at it that um, you know, we have changed the environment, so we have more vegetation than we have before. And in the last uh, 20 to 30 years, we've seen a decrease in the number of fires, however, an increase in the size of fires and the uh, on an annual basis and the uh, increase in total acreage burned. Um, also just want to mention, this is the uh, Ponderosa Pine Mixed Conifer Forest. Uh, the, this is what it used to look like in the old days. You've heard of John Muir and other early uh, visitors to California saying they could gallop a horse through the pine forest. Uh, but with the exclusion of fire, um, Ponderosa Pine uh, mixed conifer forests were invaded by white fir, uh, changed the structure of the, of the uh, forest, uh, created a greater fuel condition. And um, so we had, uh, went from a condition where we had, oops, uh, frequent fire, three to eight years visiting uh, from lightning, visiting uh, forest to uh, very infrequent fires and seeing the result in something like the rim fire. How do we know how, uh, what the fire return interval is? Um, the, we, there's various tools, uh, 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 carbon in, in um, lake bed, pollen, um, reconstructing stand histories for older forests, but fire scars give us the best information. So when fires run through the forest, they scar the cambium on the tree, the tree grows around it and leaves a little uh, mark there. So they're, especially with long-lived trees like uh, uh, redwood forest, you're able to recreate the history. So um, here is the uh, the plant communities of uh, Mount Tam watershed, the lands that we manage, very complex, very diverse. Uh, big part of that is the redwood and Douglas for forests, which have, uh, based on fire scar analysis on Bolinas Ridge, um, a fire return interval of 10 years. Uh, to every site, more or less, fire revisits and, and kept more of an open forest than what we see now. Uh, it was a fire almost every year uh, on the, along the ridge that, for the period that they were actually uh, reviewing. We're seeing rapid change uh, in our redwood forest, logged, uh, burned over in 45. Uh, uh, the the uh, tan oak that um, came back strong is now being decimated by sudden oak death. So there's a change in the fuel there and possibly a change in the fuel, the fire regime. Um, our oak woodlands uh, see uh, less frequent fire, but still a very active fire history. And they're being now invaded by, uh, in the absence of disturbance, uh, Douglas fir, again, uh, a change in the ecosystem. Chaparral, uh, another widespread vegetation type, sees fire least frequently. Uh, but when it burns, it burns everything uh, right to the ground. Um, so that's, that's a, uh, a fire regime that's, um, you know, in marked a difference between a redwood forest where fire maintains the structure versus chaparral where um, the vegetation is renewed completely by a fire. So what do we have now? We've got since the, uh, since the days before uh, um, Europeans arrived. We've got more houses. We have more vegetation in neighborhoods. We've planted uh, ornamental shrubs. We have uh, urban forests on our hill slopes that were once grasslands. We have narrow roads, steep terrain. All of these lead to, uh, to catastrophic uh, potential. 
So what are some of the strategies for managing fire uh, that agencies can take? We can um, do mechanical thinning of vegetation. We can use prescribed fire to reduce fuels to mimic um, natural fire. We can create fuel breaks. Uh, we can build defensible space next to our homes. We can all do that together so we have a, 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 uh, an integrated neighborhood protection and you can make improvements to your house and property to protect your, your house in the face of a wildfire. Uh, I just want to mention that we have um, a lot of collaboration that's been ongoing. The plan that we did for our lands was done in cooperation with uh, Marine County Open Space District back in 95. We're renewing that plan. We work closely with Marine County Fire and development of that. Uh, there's new tools available for uh, describing hazards and, and projects. Uh, Fire Safe Marin is a, is a good go-between between, uh, between the government agencies and the homeowners. And uh, th there's the, uh, the subject of community wildfire protection plans as a path forward. So what does the future hold? Um, we're going to see, continue to see increasing fuel loads. We, are, we can't address all of uh, the vegetation in the county. Sudden oak death is continuing to decimate our oak trees and, and cause some change. Uh, climate change is, uh, um, is with us. And um, th there's consensus among scientists that climate change is going to um, uh, increase the duration and um, frequency of uh, uh, extreme fire weather conditions, red flag conditions. We'll have longer fire seasons. They'll start earlier, they'll last longer. Uh, at fires, we'll have greater intensity and uh, much higher uh, risk of fires escaping early suppression. So that's, that's facing us. So the opportunity for us is to develop uh, parklands and, and communities that are resilient in the face uh, of these. So that's, that's the challenge, and I think Linda's um, um, talk is going to address uh, a real-life approach at, at dealing with that. I think that's it. Linda Dahl is Director and General Manager of Marin County Parks and, and Marin County Open Space District. Linda oversees 34 open space preserves totaling 16,000 acres and 250 miles of roads and trails with 333 trailheads. Her department's recently produced a comprehensive draft uh, entitled Vegetation and Biodiversity Management Plan. And there's a copy of it on the back. I was going to bring it up and show it to you, but I didn't do that. R Linda spent 19 years working for the National Park Service. Most recently, she was chief planner for Yos at Yosemite National Park. She's worked in over 25 parks all over the country, including the Everglades Ecosystem Restoration Project in Florida's 16 southernmost counties. Her focus has been on, the con on conflict resolution, especially related to protecting beautiful and fragile natural lands while accommodating the many people of diverse abilities and preferences who want to live next to, make a living from, and recreate on them. When asked in an interview with Marin, uh, Marin Magazine, what are your biggest challenges in managing open space, Linda answered in part, there are so many. One big concern is fire. All the land managers and fire officials in Marin will tell you that. We worry about the interface where homes meet natural lands and sources of ignition. Linda quoted a, a Tiburon fire captain saying the three top sources of ignition in Marin are men, women, and children. <laughs> <laughs> Linda, please come up. Thank you very much. And I'm going to leave the lights up, please. Thank you. 
Well, my name is Linda Dahl, and I came from the National Park Service. I, I want to recognize a couple of people in the audience that will be a resource to you uh, when we get to the Q&A at the end. First of all, Michonne Martin, who is with the Marin County Open Space District and Marin County Parks, and she's the Chief of Resources Management and Science. And Jennifer Chapman's here, who is the Fire Information Officer from uh, Golden Gate National Recreation Area. I don't know if we've got any other... Um, fire professionals in the room or not that we should acknowledge. But um, anyway, I, I did come from Yosemite National Park, and I was interested to see Mike Swayze's uh, pictures of Yosemite. It's really different here for, for me, especially because Yosemite's 1,200 square miles. And every time a storm comes through, there are 13 new fires. Um, it's lightning. In Yosemite, even though the Rim Fire was a careless campfire, so that man, women, and children thing comes in um, to play as well, it, it's, it's mostly campers, uh, and it's the, the number one source of fire in a lot of these big natural areas is lightning. We don't have that much lightning here in Marin, and, um, and, and it really is about the, 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 urban, uh, the urban interface where the fire starts. I, my, my background is, I'm a, my training is a city and a regional planner. And that discipline is all about how the, the built environment overlays with the nat natural environment. And in Jefferson County, Colorado, 30 years ago, it was my job to build subdivisions into the natural area. And it was, and, and then I sat on the planning commission. And so I'm pretty familiar with about that urban interface and what you really need to worry about. I believe that we were not that sophisticated when a lot of the approvals were granted, especially in southern Marin, about what the perils were. And I think the fire officials in this county have a very difficult job in protecting you, especially you who, who live in southern Marin, because it's that urban interface and the narrow roads that Mike talked about um, that, that make the fire officials' jobs really difficult. Um, there are also a lot of pictures of fire in Mike's presentation and there will be a lot of pictures of fire in Jason's presentation and there will be only one picture of fire in my presentation. And, and, I'll, and I'll talk to you a little bit about why that is. So let me go to the next slide. This is what I want to talk to you about today. Can everybody hear me all right? Okay. I want to talk about our vegetation and biodiversity management plan because we think it's cutting edge. We've included uh, everybody in the fire community and the public in trying to develop this thing. It's still in draft, so we really encourage you to learn more about it and, and comment. We wanna, I want to talk to you about the history of vegetation management, especially on Marin County Open Space District lands, understand how the vegetation plan will be used, examine regional knowledge, emerging science, and new data. Um, uh, Greg made a joke about how, why we have to keep talking about this, and, and he gave three good reasons. The, the number one main reason that we keep talking about it is our understanding emerges and evolves, and we really learn something every day. I mean, Jason Weber, who has the job of protecting y'all throughout Marin County, especially in the incorporated areas and the, and the wildlands, um, every time I get an email from him or every other time, it's about new things that we're learning and what's in the literature, what kind of science is developing, and, and that's really important for us to stay current. Um, we're going to talk about what our recommendations in the plan are to date. We're going to discuss what does the law require whenever we do something on public land, and then talk to you about the next steps. So go ahead, and Kathy's running my PowerPoint, right? I think you all know about Marin County Open Space District, but it's, we've been around for 40 years. Last year was our uh, 40th anniversary. People in this room helped to start the Open Space District. It was a grassroots effort. Um, it's a difficult system to manage. It's like the opposite of Yosemite. 1,200 square miles, big block of land up in the middle with not much around it. I mean, we had eight gateway communities, but they were way down there here by design, the open space preserves were placed in among the homes, and then more homes were built up against it. They, they, were, they were designated to prevent homes from crawling up on the hill. We have 3,500 backyards, about 3,500 backyards, that abut the open space. So we really care what people do in their backyard. Um, the very final one is really important. Uh, public safety is a primary goal. This is not a nature versus people discussion. This is about how we all learn to live together and protect uh, the, the public assets and the public health. So 1972, 
many of you in the room were instrumental. This is the open space district is supported by your parcel tax. It was established in 1972. Uh, many of you know that in 19, uh, I'm sorry, 2012 last year we got Measure A passed, which is another, we're, we collected about uh, $12 million additional money from sales tax last year that we're using on uh, both the, the uh, county service districts, uh, community service districts, and the uh, open space and county park land. Um, here's the main reason the open space district was set aside, is to protect natural resources, to provide for enjoyment, and to separate the communities. We have over 300 trailheads. This number keeps changing. Uh, we think we're up to about 3,500 backyards. We had six million visits last year, and the way we count visits is if you, I walk my dog in the open space preserve near my home every single day, so I get counted 365 times. These, this is you, 600 times, 90% of the visitors are local. This is our mission, and there is a tension built into our mission. Y'all who are here, I was not, set aside these open space, space preserves to preserve nature, preserve the natural environment, and to provide for enjoyment. And the minute people go up and enjoy natural areas or build their homes next to natural areas, there's a tension because you're changing it. And so that's why it's a hard job and why we've got so many people working on understanding the science and trying to manage visitors because the very reason that these lands were set aside is compromised every time your dog runs through the brush, um, every time you're uh, we've got a kid smoking up on Ring Mountain and they start a fire. These are all real concerns that we try to manage. We have 16,000 acres, as Kathy said. Um, we've got a lot of, we've, about 85% of Marin is in conserved land when you count the farmland. So, we, I mean, we just, we live with this richness uh, and it's really wonderful, but we've got a lot of management concerns. Go ahead, Kat, Kate. The biggest one, when I first got here, um, I'm coming up on four years in this job in, by June, and one of the biggest concerns was, I got here and everybody said, we need more enforcement. Why aren't you getting after the French broom? I mean, all these competing needs, and, and, and there was no money. We couldn't figure out, what the heck? I mean, we're collecting a lot of money from y'all, and there was, we, we had a hard time really figuring out what were you spending it on? We knew we had a lot of rangers, we know we've got a lot of programs, but the things that the, the managers of this program and the citizens were demanding, we weren't able to figure out exactly what we were spending money on. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit more about that in a minute. But obviously we've got uh, a maintenance backlog on environmental degradation. We've got a lot of um, fire roads, we've got a lot of old ranch roads that we inherited that are dumping sediment into the Salmon and Bering streams, for instance. We've got public safety concerns. Uh, these preserves are in the backyards, and they, um, while they're wonderful to have in your backyard, they're a real conduit for fire. If fire starts in one home and spreads to the next, very and, and they about the open space preserve, that's a real problem for us. Um, and, and we also have um, a really rich regulatory environment that I, thank the Lord for every day, but it means that we have to be really mindful. Uh, the California Environmental, uh, California Environmental Quality Act, the Endangered Species Act, uh, the, all of the water quality regulations, the air quality regulations are things that people keep track of whether or not these public agencies are conforming. And so it over, it's an important overlay for all of our work. We built very few trails in the open space district. Um, we inherited fire roads. We inherited um, ranch roads when these lands were acquired. Kate? And some of the preserves were acquired into the neighborhoods, but more often the homes crept in to the natural lands. And many of you live near open space or near MMWD land, or near Golden Gate National Recreation Area land, and you really value it. And it's the first thing that's on the real estate brochure when they go to market your home, because it's highly prized, but it also puts you in a, a real uh, uh, place of responsibility and stewardship. The history of, of managing for fire in Marin County um, is evolving. And I give Jason and his colleagues in the fire community a lot of credit for this. 
there were notions in, when, when time first began about fire management, about what we should do. And we pursued a real active program of clearing ridgetops so that when a fire starts in Corte Madera, it doesn't spread to Mill Valley, which is a really important concept. Um, we didn't spend as much time talking about where the edge is against your home and whether or not fire in, in your yard will go up into the open space. Well, whether or not kids playing with fireworks up in the open space is gonna come down and burn a community. Um, and, and so as the director in this program, I, I, I asked a lot of questions of the fire managers and of my staff about what we were doing and, and what we know now. So go to the next slide. Um, Back to that notion about where are we spending all of our resources. This is a picture, um, north is here. This is the Blythdale Ridge Open Space Preserve. Many of you li live near this, because I know most of you in the audience. And the red depicts where we have built fire fuel access roads and fire fuel breaks that are quite wide. And this was part of the, um, the 30 year ago conceived fire management plan. On this map, there is also depicted in orange where we did active defensible space clearing up against the neighborhoods. The gray is all private ownership. And we also, I spent a lot of time with staff in that question about where, what do you, open space rangers, um, where are you spending all of your time? Resource managers, where are you spending all of your money? And they said, we're cutting French broom. We're spending a lot of time chasing invasive exotic weeds because they are a plague. And many of you who, um, who are scientists know this, whether you're in agriculture, whether in public land management, invasive exotic weeds are taking over our natural habitat and they have to be managed. And by the way, they also burn, so you have to keep them down. So this was one of the early exercises that I did. I said, okay, so here's where we've cut, and go to the next slide. Um, and, and this is what we found along these fuel breaks. This is French broom. Uh, many of you in the room are broom busters. We have legions of broom busters in this county, people who go out with wrenches and winches over the weekend and pull this stuff out. And if you don't pull it out, is there anybody here who does not know what French broom is? Okay. Um, if you go in and cut, it's very opportunistic. So it goes into a new area that's been freshly cleared. And the first year it's this high, and the second year it's this high, and the third year it's this high. And so you can't just let it go. So go to the next slide. So why do we care about that? We care about it because this stuff is so um, prolific that it takes over the habitats, the native chaparral, the grasses that where the wildlife habitat um, is richest. And you know, uh, many, many of us are wildlife lovers and we really don't understand the connection between the soils, where the water goes, and where the vegetation is. The vegetation provides not just um, things for, for animals to eat. It also provides cover. A lot of the animals go there with it when they're in peril. Many of the animals nest there. So this is one of the reasons when you're trying to manage natural lands for environmental, their environmental quality, this is a huge consideration for you. So I said to the staff, tell me exactly how much time you're spending chasing down French broom. And they weren't really sure. So um, we went to every division of my staff and we said, add it up. And that was in 2011 and we found that out of our $5.8 million budget in the open space district that year, we spent $700,000 managing French broom. And the next year we spent $1.3 million managing French broom, which is 20% of the total budget. And every year, we create more opportunities for it. And so, and, and, and we had to really back up and say, why are we doing this? And is it effective? And how can we get in front of it? People say, well, shoot, I, you got all these volunteers, just go out there and get, every citizen in Marin needs to go out and pull up their portion, their allocation of French broom. They're already doing it. 
We had the equivalent of 13 full-time people, you all, out there pulling this stuff last year. We spent a lot of money with the Conservation Corps North Bay. I found out that Mike was a, a, a founder of, or a co-founder of Conservation Corps North Bay. They are incredible. They do incredible work. Um, and, and people say, well, get the prisoners out there. We already do. We've got prisoners up there. They, they're expensive because they require a lot, of, um, a lot of supervision. But we really came down to two principles that we decided to focus on. And any public land manager in the room will tell you that these are critical concepts if you're managing lands. The first one is sustainability. A lot of people have, I know you all talk in the environmental forum about sustainability a lot, but, and everybody's got a, a few different words, but basically it means to, that the present needs are met without endangering the needs of the future. And adaptive management. When I was in the Everglades, this was our number one song, Learn. You know, if the Army Corps of Engineers hadn't dredged and filled and built dikes and levees, we wouldn't be in the fix we were in the Everglades. And nobody, they did all this work and they didn't keep track. Is it working? Is what we intended to happen happening? And are there unintended consequences? And so on the open space preserves, not just on fire fuel management, but on everything, we're really putting this lens on everything that we do. Recognize that decision making is imperfect and that as decisions are made, we must monitor and measure effectiveness and adjust. We're constantly learning and constantly adjusting. Decisions without data and consultation should never happen. People out there know things that we don't know. If you don't take stock and learn, then you're, it's the path to perdition. And if we have a reluctance to adjust, because this is the way we've always done things, we're in a trap. So developing the plan. Go ahead. This is the Vegetation and Biodiversity Management Plan for the Marin County Open Space District. And the first thing we said was, holy cow, we don't have the capacity on staff to do all of this. And the same people have been here for a really long time. Let's bring in, let's enrich our gene pool. So we did a request for proposal and we hired these people. Uh, Lauren May is a, a renowned and esteemed botanist. We hired fire professionals, retired Forest Service, retired uh, uh, California State Parks, retired uh, uh, California, um, help me Jason, fire, uh, huh, CDF, CAL FIRE. Um, these are all the people they worked for, I won't go through all of them, but these people have done a lot of work on a lot of public lands, next one, more of their list, and then we said, okay, when these people, these esteemed people, come up with some ideas, what are we gonna do with that? And so we put together a science review panel. I mean, you all know that good research that's written up in the literature goes through a peer review. And so these people, and you may know many of these people on the list, helped us, looked over our shoulder, and raised important questions during the process. Go ahead. We also went out and said, okay, we're in Municipal Water District, okay, Mid Peninsula, uh, what are you doing? And what can we learn from that? Or what are you not doing that we need to learn from? And we, and, and we meet with these people regularly. I meet with these people regularly. And then what are the sideboards within which we must operate? We don't have the freedom to go do whatever the heck we want because we're a public agency. We are subject to the Environmental Quality Act, the Endangered Species Act, the, um, the state and federal requirements for, especially for water quality. And we also have in-house decisions that have been made and codified by the Board of Supervisors that we had to use, and, and they're listed here. I already talked about this. Why, why did we do this now? We had no idea where the money was going. We had a, a notion that it wasn't being spent as effectively as possible. And we also knew that it was getting in front of us, um, that we had native habitats, important habitats, at risk, and our, our counts for the wildlife were down. 
The other thing we know, because there are five public land management agencies in this county and lots of people who care about these places with their backyards abutting us, that you can't do this in a vacuum. Um, Mike Swayze's trails touch, the Marin Municipal Water District trails touch, the Marin Open Space District trails that touch the Golden Gate National Recreation Area lands. Uh, the birds don't know the boundaries. A lot of the users don't know the boundaries. And, we have, and, and, and these guys are smarter than we are in some aspects. Certainly county fire is smarter than we are in a lot of these aspects and we can't do this in a vacuum. We need to work together. So we, we put um, a plan together and it is not a plan that says cut here, grow here, make a new fire break here. It's a decision making tool so that every year the people that manage fire and put out fire in this county sit down with the land managers in this county and we make a plan and we're strategic and we do an analysis of the things that the county fire people know how to do, which is, and Jason's gonna talk about this, about what, we are not fire behavior experts, they are. Um, but we are really expert at, veg at vegetation and vegetation management. Um, how do you put all that expertise together and come up with a plan that makes sense so that everybody can put it in their budget and everybody can, can work collaboratively to, toward a scheme that makes sense. There's my picture of fire. <laughs> it's really hard. Um, it's really hard for us to do prescribed burns. We do one or two a year, and the reason it's hard for us to do prescribed burns is we're in the middle of your neighborhood. We have air quality constraints, um, if it gets away from us, I'm toast. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. It scares me to death. And when there is a prescribed burn out there, it's the safest place in Marin County. The last time we did a prescribed burn, we had eight fire agencies and all of their personnel and their equipment. It was in uh, uh, Terra Linda. Um, but we're really careful. It's really hard for us to do this. It's easier for GGN Array, Point Reyes to do this, but we have to be really precise. And all of those ecological benefits that Mike talked about, about fi um, fire coming through, we all know that fire has a beneficial effect. It's really hard for us to use that. So we're really more about um, clearing things that, that pose a, a peril. We clear them with uh, mechanical means uh, for the most part, and then we try to make sure they don't come back so that it's efficient. And we can't do that in a vacuum either. See, these, there are other things that we have to take into consideration. Anytime we do a plan as a public agency, if it constitutes a major action, we have to do an environmental impact report, and there's gonna be a big one on this plan, and we're in the middle of it right now. The IPM ordinance for the county has a lot of, um, a lot of good guidance in it. There's an IPM commission, Kramer Winslow, who's in the audience, is on that commission. And, and on that, that um, follows that same mandate of staying abreast of what uh, uh, integrated means are out there for um, treating rodents, keeping down rodents, keeping down unwanted plants. So we have to adhere to that. We've got a rodent trail management plan that's on the front page of the paper far more often than I like. Um, we've, got our sister, we've got our sister land managing agencies. Um, and, and we've got all of these, we've got 11 cities and towns and 14 uh, fire districts, fire city and town fi fire agencies and, and uh, special districts. And each one of those really cares about what we do. There's not one fire district that we don't touch and coordinate with because we have to. Go ahead. So here's what the plan's all about. And I'm just gonna really fly through this because I think several of you in this room could give this presentation for me because you've been participating. We did a lot of public workshops, Kate. Um, another. And here were the goals, here are the goals. Um, provide a framework for collaboration with the adjacent public land owners and public agencies. Manage vegetation for the preservation and protect protection of native habitats and native species. Coordinate vegetation and fire management actions to reduce or eliminate uh, priority invasive plant infestations. Provide the public with opportunities to engage. Ensure funding and support and capacity necessary to make these goals come true. 
So again, we've got this tension, you know, we're trying to manage. I was in a, a meeting with Jason and uh, several of the other Southern Marin fire captains, and I said something about the um, important, sh the, the, the rare and important chaparral, and his, the color came out of his face. Chaparral, if you're trying to put out a fire, is really hard stuff. And he said, I can't imagine chaparral being good. Well, chaparral is where a lot of the birds go to raise their young or go when a dog's chasing them, um, and, and it's important. So how do we manage that? If it's in your backyard and it catches fire, um, all of a sudden chaparral's pretty tricky stuff to talk about. So, um, and I'm gonna fly through this, but these, these are the steps that we went through, Kate. Um, we found through this process, we had not done data collection on the open space, your open space preserve lands. We found out that we have 107 native plant communities. Holy cow, I mean, this is a really rich place. That we have 37 known special status plants. We have 11 special status wildlife species. And we have nine locally important plants that occur only here. Well, you have to really be careful about what you go up there and cut and where you put new homes. We also found out we've got some serious problems up there. Uh, broom's the biggest. Acacia is pretty this time of year. The broom is too. You know, peop, the re, one of the reasons we have broom is people bought it at the nursery and put it in their yard. It's pretty. Why do we hate broom? Go to the next one. So this is what we need to do to manage vegetation in the Marin County Open Space Preserves. And it's a similar list to Golden Gate National Recreation Area. Number one, actually they're not in priority, natural resource protection and restoration, invasive plant management, fire fuel management, forest health and management, and management for climate change. So we went up there and we actually mapped our vegetation types. It's the first time, like I said, we've done this. And it just knocked our socks off. We found out, everybody just assumes the little county open space preserve has nothing good left. And we do, we've got a lot of cool stuff left. And so we, we organized it into, into zones of its importance for natural resources. And, and the, 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 the most highly valued zone is legacy. We named it legacy. The next one down is sustainable natural system zone. The next one down is natural landscape zone. And then we've got the highly disturbed zone, which is the area behind my house and at our trailheads. And we, and we went through and we mapped these. This is an example of what it looks like. So we went into Cascade Canyon which is a really diverse open space preserve, and this is it. And then we put these vegetation types over it and said, holy cow, what does this tell us about managing Cascade Canyon? So go to the next slide. And then we put the sensitive plants that are protected by law and resulted in the final, whoop, and then the wooey where it's up against your home um, and where we've got invasive plants, and then we came up with this, and this is a little difficult to see, but the very dark areas, we said, wow, we've got really important legacy zone there where endangered species are living. We've also got a lot of, of um, other special places, and this gave us really good information about where the opportunity is to put new trails, where the opportunity is to do new fire breaks. Go to the next one. What this teaches us is this is MMWD land. The really dark stuff is where on our county open space preserves, it's really special. Well, it turns out what they're managing in MMWD is really special too. And we want to really be careful at what we do on that ridge top where the MMWD land touches our land. Go to the next one. So we also found out that roads and trails are conduits for weeds. The fire breaks are, are infested with weeds. We've got a lot of deferred maintenance. We haven't been able to take good enough care of this, so go to the next one. So here's how it works. This is what it looked like before we started doing every, anything. Then we put in a trail. So we've got some little French broom plants coming along. They occurred on bike tires and horse tails and everything else. Then we said, okay, let's turn this particular one into a fuel break. So we went out there and we cut it back, so the fire stops there and the, the broom had even more opportunity. So every year, that's my guys, they're out there in CCNB, and if we don't do it, this is what it looks like. And it's at the top. By definition, they're the, they're the ridge fire fuel breaks, so the seeds get cast down, and so every year, they're further down. It's a real problem. 
On this picture, the orange lines are where we cut fire fuel breaks. Go to the next one. That's the picture of where the French broom went. It's not a coincidence. This is the Blythedale Ridge. This is where we cut the fuel breaks. That's where the French broom is. So there's a correlation that is undeniable. And so at some point we need to decide in concert with, in this case, Mill Valley Fire and County Fire, is that so critical that we need to go up, we need to maintain the fuel break, and we need to go up there every year and manage that broom. And furthermore, we need to manage it out of existence. And in some cases, the only way to manage, the only way to get rid of broom is you cut it for a couple years in a row and you treat the stem the trunk, in some cases, the broom up there is this big. You treat the, 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 the stump with a, uh, an agent that is effective in making it not come back, and, and it's very labor intensive. Broom is bad, this is the one I was looking for before. Why do we hate broom so much? Um, first of all, it is really opportunistic and really pervasive. It eliminates wildlife life habitat, um, it keeps coming back. It's really prolific in casting seeds, and, um, and it is in hugely in expensive for us to maintain. So what are we doing with all of this information? So we got together with uh, the fire agencies, and we said, we really believe that you have a hard job, and we want to make sure we're not making your job harder. And safety is number one in the county mission. How do we work together and figure out the most effective place to manage vegetation to, uh, to reduce the fire risk? And it's not just, let's go out, let's make a policy, and we're going to go on every ridgetop, and we're going to cut everything and call it good. In each neighborhood, behind each home, district by district, preserve by preserve, we have now made a decision-making matrix that we are using um, at the beginning of each fire year, at the end, actually the beginning of each budget year, and to say, in this area, is the ridgetop fuel break the best? Is the defensible space behind a home on the open space land the best? Is defensible space on other public land the best? Is giving the, the homeowner more resources to actually cut in their own yard because uh, it's expensive to take down trees and vegetation and is that a barrier and what can we do to underwrite that if those trees are really posing a risk um, I am out of time and as you can tell I could go on forever <laughs> but the good news here is the people who care about this the people who you are paying to take care of this are all working together. And we're trying to be precise and use science and use the lessons that we've learned in the past and coordinate um, the, the reduction of fire fuels in your community. And I'm gonna leave it at that. Uh, as I said, I can go on and on. And Jason is gonna talk to you more about what's going on with county fire. So thank you for your great attention. Jason Weber started his career with Marin County Fire Department as a seasonal firefighter three days after graduating from high school. <laughs> During his career with Marin uh, County, he has held the positions of firefighter, paramedic, fire engineer, captain, senior captain, battalion chief, and deputy chief. Chief Weber holds an associated associate's degree in fire science, bachelor's degree, and chief fire officer certification. Chief Weber makes it a priority to give back to our communities and to lead by example. Um, he, one of his actions was to create the fire explorer post um, at County Fire. Chief Weber continues to play an active part in making sure the Marin County's fire training program provides personnel with top-notch education and skill based uh, and a skill-based curriculum, making sure that they're always ready to respond promptly and mitigate any situation they're faced with. Collaboration is also very important to Chief Weber. He works tirelessly to build and maintain strong relationships with landowners 
and maintains uh, uh, stakeholders, <laughs> sorry, landowners, stakeholders, community groups, fire agencies, locally and statewide, volunteer organizations, and fellow county uh, departments. With over 20 years of experience in emergency services, Chief Weber has been able to work uh, to help revise and, de and develop a comprehensive fire plan uh, to help improve public and firefighter safety. Jason. Good morning, everybody, and thanks for having me here today. You know, we've heard Mike and Linda both talk about everything that's out there and, and uh, you know, working together is the only way we're going to be successful here and uh, the challenges uh, um, keep you up at night for sure. Um, everything from preventing, preparing, all the way in through response. But uh, as Linda closed and Mike, you know, the, the working together is really how we're going to be successful. It's working with all of you as community members, working with our different land managers in the county. Uh, it is very unique, um, especially with the open space preserve, 26 preserves, um, and it, it isn't a single block of land where we can really say, let's just build a large uh, fire or fuel uh, modification here that's 200, 300 feet wide, a half a mile wide, and will protect this national park from the uh, populated areas. It's, it's much more difficult than that. It's, it's these little um, fingers of land that run in between communities that have uh, you know, great environmental um, resources, but also provide, um, you know, a threat to the communities. And uh, we'll get through this. We're going to work together. And uh, uh, I'm looking forward to, you know, the next 20 years um, of really building a, a relationship with the communities, the neighborhoods, the land managers that's successful. And I think we're well on our way. So let's get started. My, uh, my mission today is to talk a little bit about response. You've heard about fire ecology. You've heard about land management. Now we're left with um, kind of the last resort, and that's, that's response to a fire. So um, I will uh, get started here. We're going to talk a little bit about the type of equipment we use, the incident command system, which is really how we organize a fire, uh, initial attack fires, uh, extended attack fires, major fires, and then the California mutual aid system, and how we're able to, to, to work through these things. So our dispatch levels are based actually on a burn index. So we use science to tell us how fire is going to burn that next day. And we, uh, we submit all kinds of data to a, 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 a data, uh, national uh, data system that punches out a number um, towards the end of the day that tells us what our threat will be tomorrow. And it's based on fuel conditions, predicted weather, current weather. Um, and it, it's pretty accurate as to how a fire is going to react that next day. Uh, we have the good fortune of being the air conditioner for the Central Valley here. So, um, you know, it's common that we have a windy afternoon, especially what we call turnaround days after um, many days of, of uh, uh, heat and, and, and dry weather. All of a sudden, uh, you know, we end up on that third day. And it's like a three to five day cycle, as we're all used to here. Um, with pretty significant winds uh, off of, out of the northwest and, and west, depending on where you are in the county. But anyway, we've got a low, medium, and high dispatch, and it's based on the burn indices. Uh, generally, a low dispatch is two fire engines and a battalion chief, so pretty small response. Um, and the dispatchers have the autonomy in our organization to upgrade that response if they feel that um, you know, the, the, the lower response isn't going to be sufficient. Second is a medium dispatch, which we're in probably about 90% of the time during the summer months. That's five fire engines, a battalion chief, a bulldozer, a water tender, an air attack, two air tankers, a helicopter, and two fire crews. And that's from the county fire's response. Um, we're one of six contract counties in the state of California, so if you wonder why Cal Fire doesn't exist here, they're actually paying us um, to provide the level of protection that they would provide if they were here in the county. The other five are Orange, Los Angeles, Ventura, Kern, and Santa Barbara, so all, all in the south. Uh, a high dispatch is uh, seven fire engines, a battalion chief, a bulldozer, water tender, one air attack, two air tankers, a helicopter, two fire crews, and other resources as um, the either responding battalion chief requests, uh, a local government battalion chief, or uh, one of the duty chiefs in our organization may upgrade the response just based on conditions and, and initial reports. So some of the equipment we use. The uh, top left uh, corner is a Type 3 four-wheel drive fire engine. That's our primary wildland fire engine here in the county. Uh, we have 12 of them. 
um, they cost about $350,000 a piece, if you can imagine that. Uh, they carry 500 gallons of water, three firefighters, um, uh, several thousand feet of, of hose and hand tools, uh, chainsaws, those kinds of things to accommodate uh, what the needs are. Uh, to the top right is a water tender. This water tender has 2,200 gallons. We have about five spread throughout the county. And uh, in areas uh, such as the watershed, uh, uh, your more rural communities that don't have municipal water, they're an integral part of the system. The bottom left is what you see in most municipalities. That's a type one fire engine. It has a thousand gallons of water, three firefighters, um, and equipment primarily for structural fire response. Uh, in this county, most type one engines can also accommodate a lot of the needs of the wildland fire environment, um, just because of the being in the wildland urban interface. Resources are ordered through the mutual aid system, generally as strike teams. So that's a set number of resources. In the case of engines, uh, engine strike team is five fire engines uh, and a battalion chief as a leader. Uh, they have common communications. About 22 people uh, are spread across those engines. And uh, they respond as a group and can be tasked out as a group. When we talk about a little bit about organizing a fire, the incident command system, it, uh, and I think Mike mentioned that the fire service is a lot like um, of, you know, in some cases is larger than, than some countries, military. And uh, you can imagine trying to, in a dynamic fire environment that's changing, um, a lot of chaos, evacuations in progress, trying to keep things organized um, and an approach to not only containing the fire, because that's ultimately our goal from stopping it and moving into other neighborhoods, but also getting people out safely. It can get a little chaotic and keeping it organized is, is critical. So some of the air resources we use, as I said, we're a contract county with CAL FIRE. Although we're not CAL FIRE, we work uh, very closely with them. And uh, the air support all comes from CAL FIRE. We don't have any of our own helicopters or airplanes. So the air attack that you see above in the top left is the aerial platform. And that's what we call really the, the in the old days, they used to call them air bosses. And uh, they orchestrate the, the aerial response. So they're working with the battalion chief or the incident commander on the ground talking to each other, kind of eyes in the sky, if you will, but also maintaining that, that air environment, making sure that news media helicopters aren't in the way, uh, that uh, hazards such as power lines, cell towers, other things are, are, are recognized by the incoming aircraft. Um, and then the uh, bottom right is a lead plane, and uh, these planes are used with the larger, mostly federal air tankers, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second when we talk about air tankers. So the uh, S-2 turboprop is uh, CAL FIRE's primary aircraft. It's a very effective aircraft. Um, unfortunately, that the newest one in their fleet is 50 years old. Um, and although I'm glad we're out of a generation of Cold War and war itself, um, but un unfortunately, that also lent to a lot of the aircraft that we use in fire suppression. So um, they're, 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 it's an aging fleet. It's all been upgrade, upgraded to turbo. Um, and uh, they're pretty quick. They've got 26 spread throughout California. They're very effective for initial attack. Um, they have 1,200 gallons of fire retardant on it. And I had a question earlier from one of the audience members about what is fire retardant, and I'll talk a little bit about that in the panel. Um, but they, there's two of them in Santa Rosa with an air attack, and uh, Ukiah, uh, Hollister, uh, the, the rotary wing, which we'll talk about, it comes from different bases. But they get here pretty quick, and, and they're very effective for us. And they don't stop fire. Um, and we get plenty of phone calls in our dispatch center during a fire saying, the fire, the tankers need to drop. You need to get more tankers. And, um, you know, the whole idea is it retards the spread of fire, slows it a little bit down, so the folks on the ground are more successful, the bulldozers, the engines, et cetera. Helicopters. Helicopters are very effective, especially around our watershed where we have a, uh, a water supply. We may order more air tankers if they're working around Kent or one of the other uh, reservoirs in, in the watershed just because the turnaround time what we call daisy chaining uh, uh, helicopters into into the uh, uh, the system is, is very effective uh, most of Cal Fire is going to a, um, a belly bucket you can see in the top left corner um, others are buckets which uh, you can see in the bottom and uh, just dip right out of there they carry several hundred gallons of water um, and can be pretty exact as to where they put it they also bring a crew of about six firefighters with them um, that it will start cutting line or work off of a deer trail, lighting fire behind of them, starting to build some black in. Um, and the helicopter generally works with those crews uh, supporting their operation or one of our engine companies on the ground. Bulldozers. So we have a bulldozer. It's based out of our headquarters, which is in Woodacre. 
uh, and responds all over the county um, as well as out of county to support the state's mission. Uh, this is really building direct fire line is what they're, they're, they're made for. So when the fire is too intense for hand crews, which we'll talk a little bit about, um, and, and we need to, to have mineral soil line around a fire, uh, we'll use our bulldozer. They're really effective in brush and grass, um, uh, become a little less effective on initial tax standpoint in, in timber, um, but still are a, uh, an amazing resource. They can get into areas. Um, and I've seen our bulldozers on hillsides that you could never believe uh, they're there. And, um, you know, we used them in the National Park Service during the uh, 1995 Vision Fire. And post-fire rehabilitation, the Park Service was very happy with um, how those, how we were able to go back in and, and do rehab in those areas um, with, with pretty minimal impacts on the environment. Fire crews. And... Uh, so our fire crews, mostly in the state of California, are inmate fire crews. Uh, they're based out of Delta Camp, which is kind of over by Rio Vista. Um, and about 10 years ago, the Board of Supervisors uh, um, supported creating our own fire crew here in the county with the primary mission of fuels work, fuel reduction work to support our mission um, and work with the different land managers and private landowners throughout the county. And uh, our fire crew is a 12-person fire crew. They work nine months a year, so they're just about ready to go off-season uh, and they've been doing vegetation management work. And some of that smoke you've seen coming from projects uh, in Novato and then in Larkspur um, is what they'll do is they'll come in and, and cut an area, pile, and then go back after the rains start and burn. And uh, we just had a very successful project with open space uh, that created a wonderful defensible space uh, behind Larkspur. Um, but it had mutual benefit, and, and this is where uh, Linda and I are really working together on, is finding mutual benefit. Where can we create defensible space but also reduce non-natives? And uh, th this project was a perfect example of that. Overhead, I talked about orchestrating a fire and how that's all done and the challenges there. Uh, you can imagine it, it gets chaotic. Um, our battalion chiefs run a fire right out of the front seat of their pickup. That's really their office. It's kind of where they orchestrate from. Uh, radio communications and everything, they have multiple radios in there, telephones now, even computers that, uh, that the dispatch center is sending them back and forth. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about where they fall into this. So let, let's talk about a fire response here in the county. It'll give you an idea of what's happening. So we get a dispatch in Southern Marin. Uh, every area in the county is blocked out for certain responses, making sure you're getting the closest resources. Here's kind of a list of the fire stations. A red are county fire stations. They're, they're also under our contract with the state of California, we have to have them in these locations. Um, and that's where your type three engines come from, but also all the local government agencies in the county uh, are highlighted in yellow. And really the way Marin County Fire Service works is we act as one fire agency when it comes to response, planning, mitigation, that kind of thing. We, we aren't 14 separate agencies. Um, uh, we are boundaryless when it comes to uh, someone needing help. We talked a little bit about what resources we're getting coming to the fire, and that can add up to 20 plus resources very quick, even on a relatively small fire. Our success rate for um, extinguishment is, was 99% last year based on keeping it 10 acres or less. Mike talked a little bit about the challenge of that is, um, you know, we don't really have a choice to let fires grow and kind of pick a natural barrier and put them up against there because we're in and around homes. So a success rate of 99% keeps me very happy. That's 99% of fires kept at 10 acres or less. Um, and that has to do with the effective response here. Um, and uh, you know, I think if anybody watched that fire July 4th, this last fire season on TAM, you could see fire trucks coming from different fire roads, kind of uh, uh, from different communities and, and making sure we had all, all of our bases covered. So the, uh, if this were the fire and we just picked, you can see all those yellow dots are homes. Um, this is, uh, you know, maybe 10 acres at this point. Uh, the first unit on scene, no matter what their rank and the way the ICS system were, would establish command. They would be the incident commander until they were relieved of that. So we start with a, a single point of uh, contact, if you will, as the incident commander. This is kind of how a very small scale fire uh, would be organized. So you have an incident commander. They would probably quickly, in this case, establish operations just because the need to liaison with law enforcement for evacuations, uh, working with the air attack above, creating divisions is how we break up the fire, and I'll show you on a map what that looks like. Um, the divisions are essentially the bosses uh, for certain areas of the fire, and then we, we assign resources to them. 
So now the fire goes in, and that would be what we consider initial attack. Now it goes into extended attack. So a fire that's going to go past an operational period, which is generally about 12 hours. So if we're going to extend beyond the first operational period, we call the fire an extended attack fire. At this time, we'd expect orders like strike teams of engines. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the state mutual aid system, how we get those. Uh, you know, strike teams of hand crews, you're going to start seeing instead of give me one engine, two engines, I can start ordering things in strike teams because they come with their own leader, which means that they've, they've got support they need in management. So here's the fire on a topo map. Um, you can see now we've got different divisions. The divisions are broken out on the map, and we try to pick uh, you know, obvious landmarks that are easy to describe when you're talking on a radio that I need you to go up this fire road, you'll come to this intersection, that's the division break. You're going to be working from this area north. And as you can see, the, the, the organizational chart starts to become more complex. As the incident builds, uh, it requires more resources and more overhead to support it. So as a fire goes from uh, initial attack to extended to major now, we're looking at um, you know, additional resources. But we're also looking at a management team. The state has uh, six, uh, the state CAL FIRE-wise has six management teams. Uh, as a CAL FIRE cooperator, we would engage with them. If we were on National Park Service lands, there's federal teams that come in and manage it um, because now we're dealing with a whole lot of complexity, everything from cost sharing uh, to cost apportionment to feeding, you know, thousands of firefighters setting up a base camp and all the rest of it. As the fire becomes more complex, you can see we add divisions to it uh, and start to break it up so it can be organized still. Um, and as you can see, this was uh, the Angel Island fire in the background several years ago. But you can see how complex the, the organizational chart soon becomes uh, after, you, after you enter into a major incident. Uh, right here, I want to talk a little bit about evacuations. And this is 20 minutes, pretty tight. But uh, we have what we call MTZ, or Mutual Threat Zone, maps for every area of the county. And we've pre-designated evacuations areas based on what we would expect fire in that area to do, um, where we could naturally create barriers for reverse 911 calls for law enforcement. So law enforcement carries these maps. All the fire agencies have these maps. Our Office of Emergency Services out of the Sheriff's Office has these maps. And if the IC calls me and says, I want to I start evacuations, and this happens to be the Woodacre area, uh, specifically Woodacre proper, I can call our OES and say, Please go to the Woodacre area MTZ map. I want an evacuation notice immediately for the area that's in brown on the east side of the map. Um, and they can shelter at um, the uh, Lagunitas School. It's already pre-designated. We know what we're doing. We can call the local disaster council, say, set up the shelter. We can give law enforcement this map and say, I want evacuations. The priority is this. And it just makes things go very, very well. And we're all speaking on the same same wavelength, if you will. Plus, these are all pre-programmed in the reverse 911 system, so OES just has to hit go, and thousands of phone calls are going out. The California Mutual Aid System is why we're so effective in this state and why parts of the United States are so ineffective when there's a disaster. And I think we saw that with you know, the hurricanes and other things. Uh, unfortunately, California is used to disasters, but we do it very well. <laughs> so the state is broken up into different regions. And when we start talking about ordering, you know, there's about 30 engines on duty every day in this county from the different fire agencies, but you could go through those in about five minutes. So uh, Marine County Fire is the operational area coordinator so for this county. Um, so those requests would come into our dispatch center. We would then send them to the Region 2 dispatch center uh, over in Alameda. They would then process that into Sacramento headquarters, which would send it to the different regions based on closest available resources, and those resources would start coming to our county. It's almost instantaneous. The system works very well. There's two GACs, or Geographical Area Coordinating Centers, that the federal and state agencies work out of. Uh, those are in Redding and in Riverside, and those are really for the state resources. And as all of this is happening, I call it the Ouija board, everybody's moving. Um, because you've got to keep the system dynamic. And as, when I've got the duty coverage and we have a battalion chief that's now engaged in, in a fire in Southern Marin, I'm immediately working with the agencies to start moving resources around so we're ready for our next incident. Um, and that's what this system really is all about. It's, it's staying dynamic, being able to respond to the fire you have, but being prepared for the next one. 
I think it's an important reminder that we uh, don't forget the Mount Vision fire. And I know one of the questions we're going to talk about today is where's our greatest threat? And we talked a lot about Southern Marin. Um, everywhere in this county has a significant fire threat. And it was uh, just shy of 20 years ago, um, I remember it like yesterday, that we had the Mount Vision fire. And the fire destroyed over 40 homes. Um, I don't know how we got everybody out of Drake's View Drive alive. Um, and I don't know how the firefighters survived up there, um, quite frankly. But uh, it, it happened, and I think it's just a good reminder that we need to keep in the back of our heads. And, and Linda talks a little bit about it. There isn't a single-sided approach to, to fire protection, land management in this county. It has to be an all-encompassing approach, everything from the community's defensible space to the work we're doing, uh, uh, creating fuel, fuel modification, whether it be uh, fuel breaks, ridge top, uh, defensible space, whatever it is. Um, you know, everything from planning for evacuations and being prepared for that, uh, it, it's, it's all inclusive and every community member has to be a partner with us, the public agencies, in order for this to be successful. And I thought it was a really cool painting that they did too, so. <laughs> and uh, that's it from the Marin County Fire Department. And in uh, 20 minutes, a quick, quick little tidbit about uh, what it looks like when we respond. Thank you. Um, your um, professional views were really well, um, well spoken, and uh, I'm sure that they were appreciated by everyone here. Now, I would like to introduce Ken and uh, Christina Waldeck, who are residents of, Marin, of Mill Valley and are both graduates of the Environmental Forum of Marin. Ken and Christina were recently honored with an award for good citizenship by the Tamil Pius Community Services District for their work on fire safety. Uh, their work began as an effort to make their, their lane in Mill Valley more accessible to emergency vehicles. It became a community-wide effort to clear away excess vegetation and lessen the amount of, fuel, of fire fuel. They credit their EFM, or Environmental Forum, I'm sorry, uh, training, <laughs> um, <laughs> some of us use these acronyms and we shouldn't. Um, they credit their environmental forum training and the support of many local and federal agencies with enabling them to galvanize their neighborhood to become more fire safe. We are, uh, they say, we are so lucky to live on the border of uh, the Golden Gate National Recreation Area but with that proximity to open space comes the responsibility to maintain fire safe practices. Ken is uh, of Forum Class 26 and Christina from Forum Class 27. Would you please come up? Um, we're gonna do this exactly the opposite of how it is at home. I'm gonna do the talking and Ken will interrupt and it's at home, it's he does the talking and I interrupt. <laughs> so. um, be, before we start, we just wanna ask, there's so many people to thank for, their, for the success of our endeavor and some of them are here and I would just like to acknowledge uh, those people we'll be mentioning in our story. John Elam from the T the Tamil Pius Community Services District, Jim Casper, who's our neighbor and also representing Fire Safe Marin, and Jennifer Chapman from the National Park Service, all are so important in our story. Um, before we turn the lights out, I'll just tell you that when um, I moved back to the Bay Area after living in Greenwich Village for 18 years in the mid 80s. And I said to my cousin Fred, who was with Frank Howard Allen, I've been looking in people's windows for almost 20 years. I don't want to see anything anymore. <laughs> I don't want to see any more people or buildings. And this is what happened. <laughs> this is the view from our bedroom. And as you can see, we've have to be very diligent about fire safety because we are right on the border of the GGNRA. This is from our deck. And um, this, is, this is from the deck. That's looking towards Mount Tam, and this is looking uh, uh, southwest 
over those uh, hills there are three beaches we can hike to. It was back in September of last year where Ken and I were awakened in the middle of the night with a strong smell of smoke. Um, that's what we were afraid of. And so we got up, we looked around, first of all, in the house, then we looked outside to see if we could tell where the smoke was coming from. It was an odd smell for us because it didn't smell like a, a, a barbecue. And it, didn't, it was a very warm night, and it never occurred to us that it, was a, that it was, in fact, what it turned out to be someone was burning a fire in their fireplace on a very warm summer September night, and he, he was using green wood. So the smell was very similar to what it smells like when we've been encountering a, a, a grass fire. Uh, when we encounter a grass fire, um, you know, one of the control burns. So we were very concerned, and we ended up calling the um, 911. And within 10 minutes, the Southern Marin Fire District had two vehicles up trying to get onto our lane. That's our sign for Autumn Lane, which we learned was not very efficient. and. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, but that, it, not for the local fire department, but I'll explain at the end why they said we had to do better than that. Um, <laughs> this is the fire engine trying to get down our lane. And when it happened that night in September, of course, it was pitch dark. So, um, as, it, as I alluded to, there was not a fire incident. It was a house, it was someone burning in their fireplace. But in the course of this, Captain Kerry Glockner from the Southern Marin Fire District took me aside and said, you know, you have a real problem here. We can't even back out your lane. The vegetation had gotten so overgrown that the mirrors on the fire truck were obliterated. They couldn't back out. So not only was there a difficulty for fire, but there was also if someone had need of a, um, a rescue uh, vehicle, an ambulance was also going to have a difficult time. So we started at that, that very night planning for what turned out to be two days of vegetation uh, chipping and uh, removal. But there was a lot more to it. And um, we started with community meetings at our house where the fire department came, Carrie, Captain Glockner and others came and explained what we needed to do. It wasn't just the need for clearing the sides of the road. There was the canopy overhead that needed to be taken back and also more importantly, and this is where Ken really uh, took the lead, which was getting individual homeowners to make fire safe their own individual properties, which was a huge, huge part of this project. This type of thing is just a fraction of the kind of work that was done between the time that we had the original meetings and the first of our two um, fire, uh, our first chipping days in, in November, at the end of November, this kind of thing went over. And I'm going to ask Ken to explain what he did with the neighbors. You're going to explain. First of all, if you know, any, all of you who know Christina, it's like easy to work with because she's like, total energy, a fireball in action. So, you know, whatever I did was really in insignificant, basically. But uh, <laughs> essentially, um, you know, getting all the neighbors, oh, you want me? Getting all the neighbors together is like herding cats in a way. Um, everyone has a different personality and, and one of the things I learned is that trees are probably the most sacred thing second to cats and dogs. <laughs> and I mean, no one wants to remove a tree. It's, it's like the character. So all the streets around our area, maple, pine, you know, live oak, et cetera, et cetera. So um, basically, uh, I did talk to the Captain uh, Glockner, who's a, just a, a wonderful guy. I mean, totally, I mean, it's just more than a job and a, and a paycheck to, to the firefighters. They're, uh, wonderful people to work with and at the end of the day they were the ones that came and you'll see pictures of them uh, 
they were the ones that chipped the wood and, and organized the whole thing. And this was on a day off. So, um, you know, I can't say enough about how, how professional and wonderful they were. And they explained uh, to me what was needed to be done. And basically, it's fairly common sense. It's trying to get as rid of as much fuel as possible to create a nice open lane where you see what, what happens when it's it just narrows over time with erosion and, and plants, et cetera. And the other thing was the canopy um, so that there's not what I didn't know at the time, but crown fires are very common where they go from tree to tree. So what he explained to me basically was it's kind of like a ship uh, and all it needs is one hole in it and the, the ship sinks. So it really is an effort that if you have three-fourths of the people, that's great, but uh, you really need 100% of participation, which we ultimately got, but it, uh, you know, you have to kind of work with each individual. Everyone has a different concern and need, and we did eventually get all 18 uh, the, the neighbors to uh, participate, and they did a really great job. Plus, there are two people that were adjoining our area that also participated. Um, I think that's really pretty much, pretty much everything. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, let's see. This is the day of the, of the first chipping day. Again, this is just to illustrate how narrow upper autumn lane is. Autumn lane has two parts. Upper is a little slightly narrower than lower, but they're both very challenging uh, for fire vehicles or any emergency vehicle. Again, you can see that we just had inches on some side until we, we trim back a lot of the, um, the, br uh, the brush and uh, vegetation on the side of the road. Uh, the neighborhood, again, um, we've never had this participation in any of our projects. Uh, fire safety is way easier to galvanize the neighborhood than, say, road paving or <laughs> fixing the thing that holds up the, um, the, the mailboxes. When that got someone backed into it and knocked it over, but it took like two months to get everybody on board to fix it. <laughs> But there's a critical difference. Uh, not only is it the obvious concern for fire, but it's the support that we got from the various agencies that made absolutely the difference. The first thing Captain Glockner said is, we can provide uh, not only personnel to work with, with you, but we have grant money. And, um, and that was really got our neighbors on board. Then everybody started to perk up. And, uh, through, um, beyond that, we had Jennifer Chapman recording our meetings and our plans, so our neighbors not only heard it from us and the people at the fire meetings, but they read it in newsletters. We had John Elam telling us, don't worry about where we're gonna broadcast all the stuff you chip, I'll take care of all of that. And in the meantime, he put us in contact with um, Clements Tree Service, which was actually going to be able to provide chippers, uh, a, a chipping vehicle, and um, personnel at a, uh, at, a pr at a cost that was very, very attractive. So for the money that the fire department might have used to rent equipment, we had equipment and personnel, and that's thanks to John Elam. Um, we also had, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we also had uh, Jim Casper, who's here, who um, I think, if, Jim will correct me if I'm wrong, but we think it was because of his proximity to the Mother's Day fire years ago, which is across our canyon, where he got involved with Fire Safe Marin, and he was just a wealth of information for our project, and also made it, um, introduced us to other people who are helping us and who will continue to help us, namely PG&E. We have a, we'll show you our, our wire eating acacia tree a little later <laughs> on, but, but, and it was something that the, um, that we, with the, we did have uh, the Park Service and, um, and PG&E looking at this. We decided as a neighborhood that while we had this, while we were galvanized, let's just deal with it. But that 
doesn't mean that in the future, because this is an ongoing process, as we all know, we have uh, resources um, from these other agencies when we have to do maintenance work on our own lane. So we were all, the neighborhood was very excited. We had lots of people. Again, the, the staffing for this was from the fire department. We had seven people uh, from the fire department. We had Clements Tree Service crew, and we had other uh, uh, day workers that we as a, as a, uh, a lane hired. This is in addition to all the work that went on in between that first uh, smelling of fire and the day that we did the chipping, the neighborhood got together and uh, created fire safe areas within their own property. So there was a lot of work going on prior to this day. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is the kind of thing that went on all day. Uh, things that were had to be taken down, the canopy, there were things we couldn't do on our own. We all, as individual homeowners, we took care of mostly our property, but it was the crews that day, the fire crews and the Clements Tree Service that did most of the canopy removal and, um, the, uh, and they worked with, everybody was all hands on deck clearing the sides of the lanes. And I'll just, just interject that it was great to have the fire department because they were the ultimate arbiters. So it wasn't like I had to say, why don't we cut this and this and this? They cut what they <laughs> needed to cut. Yeah. And yeah. So be it. And yeah. there was no rebuttal. Well, <laughs> there was a little pushback, um, but not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> this is um, this was just. I mean, you couldn't see. There's a house I never knew it was there. Uh, 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 not on our property, but on the on a street next to ours. I never knew that house was there until this pro uh, this operation started. So it was a huge effort. Um, this is again, this is a neighbor directly near us. He and his son were there with their own saws and whatnot. There was a, 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 a big difference in the, the, between the, again, between the time of the first smelling of smoke and our second chipping day. So I, I'm just, you can see that. By the way, the, the firefighter closest to us is Captain Glockner and really, He's the one who planted the seed and then everybody else who jumped on the bandwagon to help us so much. You could all, I mean, within a couple of hours, you could see the difference in how, how much more accessible our lane was. We fed everybody because we thought that's the <laughs> least we can do. He did. <laughs> By the way, there's cake during the break, so. Oh. Um, <laughs> okay, um, I wanted you to see this slide because of two reasons. We've collected so much, we've created so much uh, uh, chipping material and we had so much work to do that we couldn't finish it all in one day. So uh, John Elam was gracious enough to invite us to do this again and, and dump all our stuff on his, uh, at the, Tamil Pius Community Services District lot. You would never have, this is the our house from Lower Autumn Lane and you would never have seen this until we started this uh, project. Um, and what's here is between the end of day one and day two of chipping, poor Aut Lower Autumn Lane had this pile of stuff just sitting by the side of the road until uh, and, and mostly everybody was okay with it. <laughs> um, again, this was very early on in this process. You could already see how much we, we gained two feet within about an hour. It was amazing how much different, how, how, the, the, how dramatically the changes were once the crews got there and started working. Just a, a real quick thing, uh, planes that are going overhead, if they don't see a separation in, in the road, they just, they don't know w where to put the, the fire retardants. So, I mean, this is a big, big aid for the, the airplanes when they're overhead. Mm -hmm. This is the wire-eating acacia tree, which we finally, after trying to pawn this thing off on every agency we could, we decided that, okay, we finally uh, just said, okay, it's our tree. Let's just deal with it. So, um, yeah. and again, thanks to Clemens Tree Service, they were they were going to bring down, take the tree down for us, and they said, and we'll just finish off your chipping. We'll kind of throw that in. 
So um, that was what it looked like before. This is what the side of the hill looked like after the second day of chipping. And again, um, before you would not not have seen a lot of this sky. That would have been obliterated. Also, again, thanks to Jim Casper, PG&E has been out. And um, sometime within this calendar year, they're going to come back and do a lot of vegetation removal for us. I mean, they're doing it for their benefit, but we are really the beneficiaries as well. Um, this was just pretty after the rains, but, but this, it, was, it's, it shows you that now we have, uh, we, are, we have created defensible space. And Captain Glockner was really stressed that a lot. He said, you know, we have so many resources, we're going to focus our resources on, on places that we can defend. So we really all took that to heart. That is <laughs> without the fire, e the wire eating acacia tree came down on day two. You can see the lane is much more uh, accessible. And we have a street uh. sign. <laughs> the reason for this is because it was, and this was thanks to Maureen Parton and Supervisor Sears' office. She got on the phone and we had a street sign within days. Uh, the fire department, Captain Glockner said, you know, it's fine for us to see that funky old autumn lane sign that's deteriorating because we know where you are, but if there's a serious fire incident, you're going to have firefighters from all over the state, and they won't know where Autumn Lane is, so don't make it harder for them to help you. <laughs> so uh, we took it to heart, and you can see Autumn Lane from up above uh, our street and below, so come and visit us. We'll show you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, I want to reintroduce one of the co-coordinators, Kate Powers, who's been doing a tremendous amount of work in making this program such a success today, including uh, flipping the PowerPoint presentations and uh, all sorts of other things. So now, without further ado, Kate Powers. Well, thank you for all sticking around. Um, this part of our um, presentation is going to be the Q&A, but I hope it's more of a panel discussion, and I know we have a lot of um, a lot of important uh, questions out here, a lot of educated um, topics to discuss. So I'm just going to start off by asking actually the audience a question. How many of you live adjacent to or near open space? How many of you have taken steps to accomplish some fire safe planning in the last two or three years? Great. Okay. Um, in in um, getting ready for this um, topic, I went on to the county fire department um, website, and this is for the um, camera. It's not really. Can you? Can everybody hear me? Okay. We have yeah. the other one too. Yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, I went on the county fire department website, and they have a really excellent. Um, on the front page over on the side, if you click on how to prepare for a wildfire, it's a 12 minute video and it gives you a really excellent um, few steps to start the process of how to um, start planning for your home. Um, prior to this presentation, I also emailed the, um, the um, speakers some questions to start off with, but I really encourage the audience to, um, we're only going to, answer questions for about a half hour. So if you have questions, um, I encourage you to raise your hand. And so let me ask the first question. And the first question is what, and panel members, if you, if you have anything to say, just jump in wherever you feel. Um, where are the biggest, um, where's the biggest potential for wildfire in the county and what areas do you worry about the most? Are there particular landforms or areas of the county that are, are the most watched right now? I was telling Ken at the break, unfortunately we have thousands of autumn lanes mm -hmm. and uh, you know how do you engage and, and I just we've got to take a moment and thank Christine and Ken for their leadership um, and doing what it takes because as fire agencies as public agencies we just don't have the resources to go in and do that on every autumn lane in the county. Uh, generally speaking the greatest threat is around heavier fuels um, that'll produce more BTUs, greater fire intensity, more difficult to control, 
Um, and, and we find those on the southern end and around the slopes of Mount Tamalpais, really the watershed. So kind of extending through the Ross Valley down into southern Marin. Uh, but, you know, I had that last slide on there uh, talking about Inverness, and, and there's no community in this county that is immune to the threat of wildfire. And, uh, you know, whether your fuels are light and flashy with native uh, grasses, um, you know, things can respond very quickly to the change in, in humidity and winds. Um, and, and we can lose, and we've lost in Novato several homes, um, you know, in a matter of minutes, and, you know, upwards of 40 plus homes in, in uh, heavier fuels out on the coast. Uh, most of the fires occur under what we call east wind events, or you hear in Santa Ana's, um, used commonly in south, phone winds. So north, northeast winds, our humidities drop down into uh, the low teens, single digits in some cases. We have sustained winds of 30, 40 miles an hour in the upper elevations. And when you look at fire history in Marin County, that's when we've seen the greatest loss. And you look at the big fire of Mill Valley 1929, it was under those similar wind patterns. Um, the Inverness, the Vision Fire, uh, the fires that you go back to 45 when it started at the, um, uh, the Kent, what was the, um, the mill there, and, and ran through, through the Kent drainage. So. Um, you know, there's nowhere immune, but the greatest threat is larger fuels and, and where homes are located in relation to uh, aspect, um, north or south, uh, and then alignment with drainages that are in alignment with wind patterns that are also very dangerous. And, mm -hmm. you know, I kind of cringed when I saw those pictures from the deck as a firefighter. You think, oh, no. <laughs> but people live there because they've come from uh, Greenwich Village, and they really want to see that. I would love to wake up to that view in the morning, but... Uh, you know, you've got to be aggressive and, and take action to make it as safe as possible to give you the time you need to get out and or give us the space we need to work. Okay. Linda. I'm going to add to that. First of all, you guys are my heroes. Mm -hmm. And I have a new idea. I think Jason and Southern Wind Fire and the other agencies should just take the trucks out and park them in lanes yeah. <laughs> during rush hour and make people really understand how they're tying, how your hands are going to be tied and how imperiled you are. The, the beautiful places with the twisty, windy roads are, are really scary to us. Um, so I just wanted, I wanted to add that, that I, I, my, my hat is off to you and that the more that you can, obviously, it sounds like we're preaching to the choir here, the more that you can bring awareness to people that aren't here and tap into community resources like uh, John Elam and others, and, and Jason and his crew and, and your local fire agency, that the better. I'm just going to, I was just going to add one, one okay, quick thing. Okay, go ahead, Ken. We're, none of us are completely safe because I, I learned through this this venture that embers <coughs> that fly yes. a really really long distances and land on the rooftop and and there's uh, stuff and so forth on the rooftop. So, you know, you can be quite a distance from a fire and still you're involved in it. Right. At the Rim Fire, the embers were going um, over a mile. Oh my God. And Jason's folks have told us that embers in our, with the vegetation we have, a quarter of a mile is very common. So a live ember going a quarter mile, if something's really on fire, is um, gonna affect all of us. Let me jump in. Okay. Uh, the the uh, big fires, uh, Jason mentioned the 45 fire, the Inverness fire, um, those were 10, 12,000 acre fires. Um, they only stopped because the weather stopped. Mm -hmm. So who's at risk is really driven by that weather. It could start somewhere and end up in a whole different place. So um, it really is, is we, we don't know. Yes. Yeah, hi, I live in San Antonio at the top of a fire. <laughs> <laughs> I, I closed escrow on this home three days before the Oakland Hills fire. I watched from my new house and then I looked around and wow, nobody ever mentioned fire during this entire process. <laughs> not the realtor, not the seller, and I was just going to need to think about it. So we've heard um, a lot today about the, what, the, all the work that needs to be done and the shortage of resources. My question is, has anyone tried to get the big property insurance carriers like State Farm, mm -hmm. which insures my property, to donate some tiny fraction of what they would have to shell out if there's a big fire to fund a program where, you know, there's hundreds of men every day on the streets looking for work? 
and I'm sure they'd be happy to go chip French broom. And there's your workforce, or high school kids who need community service hours, or something like that. Um, it seems like there's a lot of people who would gladly go up and do the work and <coughs> trim the, the brush and cut down the dead oaks and that sort of thing if there was funding for it. Who's your supervisor? Uh, I don't know. Oh, right now, someone? Probably Katie Rice. Probably Katie Rice. Yeah. <laughs> Katie Rice. So. Katie Rice. Speak to Katie Rice. She should form <coughs> a service organization for young people in this county. It would be a great project for her. She has young people in her family. And uh, make your project, your house, the first place for them to start working. And I'll add to wow. that, uh, in Supervisor Rice's district, um, Sleepy Hollow specifically, uh, just started a program with young kids that kind of are trying to figure out um, what they need to do and it's also giving them a little bit of work ethic before they just head off to college and, and graduate and wonder what's there and uh, secondly the Board of Supervisors did create the uh, TAM fire crew which is our seasonal firefighter so most of them are just getting out of high school and it is all labor-intensive work um, and then we've got quite a few, I mean, I know Linda's got thousands of hours invested in vegetation management. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, we're also looking at a lot of grant work um, with, with CAL FIRE now and the SRA fee. And I know Jim and I were having a conversation this morning about that um, and what resources we can pull from there. But um, you're right. I mean, this is a task that is monumental. And um, the amount of funding, I mean, we could throw nothing but money at this um, with young either volunteers or young kids and um, it's like painting the Golden Gate Bridge because you can start on one side yeah. by the time you get to the other you gotta start again mm -hmm. and uh, we're that's what we're looking at it's pro uh, very strategic approaches uh, in, in certain areas of the county so we're focusing our limited resources. Specifically the property insurance carriers seem to have a lot of risk here you would think that they would Mm -hmm. Contribute a little bit to mitigate. An organization that is already organized and is really terrific is the uh, uh, Conservation Corps of Southern North Bay, uh, Bay. North Bay. North Bay Conservation Corps. Marilyn Eckert has done a brilliant job, and the supervisors of Marin County should form a, a, a partnership with her and employ all these young people that get out and have no jobs and if they work with that organization for a year or two, it could help all of us. We, we spend a lot of money, your money, that's from the Open Space District on the Conservation Corps North Bay and there's also the program that Jason's referring to is a guy named John Hanley, who's a retired firefighter from San Francisco, His, um, has a new program called Youth to Work and it's in, based out of Sleepy Hollow but we gave him some money not a lot, because uh, it doesn't take a lot, but it's to do exactly what you describe, and it's been really supported and popular by the county supervisors, and it is to get local kids uh, out there and improving their ethic and giving them something to do in the summer, and they all come off the job with a tan and strong, and uh, there's a lot to love about it, but the, let me finish. The insurance company's response in the past has been to eliminate coverage. Uh, they don't take a lot of ownership. They don't say, we're going to make this more attractive for us. They say, you need to make it more attractive or you won't be able to be insured. And that's, the community's response has been overwhelming because if you can't get insurance, they go to the Board of Supervisors and they say, what do you, or, or to um, the, the fire agencies and say, what are you going to do to make us safe? And the one thing I wanted to add is, um, we've got, Conservation Corps North Bay, we've got the TAM fire crew, we've got youth to work. Our biggest obstacle is people who don't want their trees cut. Mm -hmm. And the Waldecks ran into that. I stood with Jason Weber and the fire chief from Mill Valley up on Blythdale Ridge and we talked about fire risk and we looked over at Mill Valley and all you could see were trees and deck rails. <laughs> people do not want to cut their trees. And so it's a real education process. I, I, that's why I like my idea of parking the, the, the <laughs> fire equipment in the lane and saying we're not going to be able to help you. I think that's a really compelling visual. Ken. You know, I, you know, that's something, I think everything you said is, is very valid and it's something that maybe you can start, you know, just like 
there's always a catalyst when you, yeah, you obviously, you, you could be the person that, mm -hmm. but I was just gonna say one thing that, one of the things that I said to all the homeowners was, actually it's a win-win situation. If you, when you trim trees and get more sunlight through, people saw, I mean, they were enthusiastic. So you can show people through <coughs> pictures that actually enhances the property. It doesn't detract when you take away trees that are, you know, uh, very close together and right against the, the building, so. We have a question over here. Well, it's not really a question. I'm Maureen Hart and I work with uh, Supervisor Kate Sears for Southern Marin, and she has had conversations with um, a number of insurers about the idea of incentivizing homeowners through breaks on some of their insurance uh, uh, premiums so that small steps could be taken by the individual homeowners. So I think that conversation with the kind of example that the Autumn Lane, the Waldex and the Autumn Lane group and the fire agencies, and just this kind of before and after kind of walkthrough of what a, a neighborhood could look like and how it really enhances value and safety is, is another thing that probably going to the insurers and bringing this kind of example together, working with the Conservation Corps and other environmental groups might be really helpful. In fact, some of the tree um, maintenance work, which is trimming and limbing and those kind of things, actually support better native plants and trees yes, and right. cover. Yes. So the, the learnings and the kind of educational experience available here is really pretty tremendous. I think this day going forward is gonna be a great example on how people can work with the, the land managers, the agencies, and neighborhoods. It really does take all those items, so we're, we're happy to, that's why I'm here today to take notes. And, and so could, could I just encourage you to encourage Kate, and I will help you encourage her, to also consider the service aspect, because I really like the idea of getting some of these young people out and employing them, so uh, that solves two problems that we have in this county. <coughs> and so asking the uh, insurance companies for donations to make that program fly, no, no. Yeah, I, I want to shift the conversation to Chaparral for just a second because I heard a number of references to Chaparral. It takes a bum rap, for one thing. And it's highly undervalued. I heard, Mike, I think I heard you say that the least number of frequency of fires, the least frequency of fires for watershed lands has been in, in Chaparral. That's correct. It, so it's hard to get it started, so it's, it's hard to get Chaparral to burn right, right. until yeah, late in the fire season. So. Hey, that broom takes over chaparral, which it does not, unless it's been cleared by Jason. Uh, <laughs> um, so you know, it's really, and then I heard you say, Linda, that it, why it's good for birds. Chaparral is probably the most important watershed vegetation type that we have in, in, in Marin County. It, it's the perfect watershed type because it takes very little water and it holds the soil. It, it, it's, absolutely vital for that. So when I see it being limbed up or removed, I shudder every time I walk on Mount Tank. Well, and it's, you're right, it is it is very important, it's critical, and it's also creating balance. And, and I'll tell you a little funny story with Michonne and I, if I can share it at the top of the ridge. Um, and it's fire perspective versus uh, 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 environmental uh, ecology perspective. And, and I said, well, what can we do to create an area because ingress and egress for us is very important and generally speaking we work from ridge tops or spur ridges when we're containing a fire and what we call it is we're building a box right we can't attack the head of a fire mid slope uh, you just can't do it um, you're ineffective it's unsafe all the rest of it and um, you know the chaparral is critically important to the watershed and, and Mike can second me on that um, I, I have we've got to be able to control it somewhere and working with, and that's why I think the veg management plan that, that the open space has done is so important. It gives us a tool to make better decisions about where we're gonna modify vegetation um, so we're more effective. So from a fire control perspective, I can have input and from an environmental perspective, they can say, that's not a great area. Could you take it to this area of convenience um, to be more effective? Because I, like you, wanna see the, the, the cover there because it, it, when we do have a fire and it's not if, it's when, uh, and we and that chaparral is nuked down to its root level, 
Um, the siltation into the watershed, the mudslides, the flooding mm -hmm. secondary to that is going to be catastrophic. Mm -hmm. um, and without mechanically altering the, the vegetation in certain areas or the introduction of fire um, through prescribed burning, we really, it's, we're stuck between a rock and a hard place. And um, that's why we're having very good conversations at the table and out in the field. How do we deal with this most effectively that is, is the least impact on the environment, but also giving us a platform to work from for, uh, for community fire protection, but also holding fire in check so it doesn't turn into 12, 15,000. We have to use the Great Pacific Fire Break on the other side of the hill, um, which is not ideal. So it's challenging. Um, and it's not that, and we do recognize now more than we did 20 years ago, when you go out and you do something and you disturb the soils and you introduce broom, it spreads and, and, and that's because we're working with the land managers. But it's, it's not easy and it's balance. So um, it, it's, it, it takes working together to figure out where the right balance point is. I'd just like to point out that the Mill Valley Fire Department, not you, they have vandalized the side of Mount Tam up above their work, the new fire uh, building, and it, it really is appalling what, what's happened up there. It will take many, many years, if ever, to uh, have that chaparral come back if they've cleared out. Um, and, and the other thing I'd like to point out is that <clears throat> over the last 40 years, we have watched broom spread across Mount Tam, and a lot of how it gets spread is on the tires of the vehicles from MMWD, from, uh, from the open space, and whoever has the ability to drive on those fire roads. We've watched broom just come in, and I think if there's some way to wash the tires, uh, which is sort of a silly thought, but if there's some way to uh, um, that is how, that is one way to We've actually, um, in this year's budget, we have uh, 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 money for purchasing a, a washing station just for that purpose. Um, you know, we're paying a lot more attention to uh, weed spread instead of throwing all our resources and trying to uh, control a broom where it's well established, is trying to keep it from invading areas that are per right. currently uninfested. So. Um, you know, m mostly it's uh, not so much tires, but heavy equipment with tracks that, uh, especially traveling in the wet season. So we, yeah. we purchased this equipment. So as we move heavy equipment from site to site, they, they get washed. We, we okay. do that as a practice now. We, we hose down our heavy equipment when we uh, transport it. Tamala. Uh, hi, I'm Tamala, and my question on the preface is that I'm a social media manager for the environmental forum Marin. We do have a Facebook site, we also have a Twitter, but I did just post an article uh, from the Chaparral Institute um, stating what was just stated here about Chaparral. So if you go to our Facebook page, <laughs> like the environmental farmer in, you will see in print what you just heard here. We have to join Facebook to do this? Uh, <laughs> actually, you know, you do not, uh, there are other ways to not join Facebook to see a page, Good. you don't get all the benefits. But anyway, you can also go to the website, environmentalforum.org, <laughs> and see some wonderful things. But when it comes to marketing, my question was, that came, that's kind of from that, so I live at the bottom of North San Pedro Ridge, literally on the Dominican side. You walk down from that ridge down a really steep trail through a whole bunch of broom and eucalyptus and other horrible things, and you come to my house. Um, we are in so much fire danger all the time right there. I think we have a fire pretty much every summer from the um, transients that camp behind me, which are all my friends. They're practically neighbors. I go out there in the mornings. I tell them, you know, when it's fire danger, the, the rest of the neighborhood does. We all kind of control that. We have tried so many times to contact the fire department about the brush and stuff and not had good response. Um, it's, it's, there's a little piece of private property that nobody wants to buy, and they always say, oh, it's private property, we can't do anything, we try the county, the state, whatever. People come and park on that fire road because it goes up to this open space and kind of nowhere, leave their trucks for days. I'll call parking, I'll call police, I'll call whoever. I can never find the right person to come and ticket and get that car gone, or who's, I've cut down all the vegetation myself to have sanitation tell me I have to pay $300 to have it taken away because I miss the one day a week we get for the chipping in our neighborhood. So to me, kind of just as citizen general, um, these are very negative marketing techniques. 
to help control the fire in our neighborhood. Every experience I've had personally has had a negative return. Now, I hear all these wonderful programs happening here. I know they're true because I'm an environmental former Marin. How are you, how do I, how do we market what's happening? Because I think if people knew more about this program you talked about, about what you're really doing, everyday people, not just the people in this room who are really interested and already know it. How do you, how do I, how do we market this information to Marin's citizens? Because I think if they see the positive stuff, they're gonna be even more willing to get on the bandwagon and cut down than if they just have the same negative response that I had for years. Well, I hope you're a friend of our agency on Facebook and Twitter because <laughs> we, do, we do advertise and try to promote whenever we have positive interaction, whether it be a community group that, that TAM Community Services District, um, even with the city of San Rafael, when we do projects with them in, inside the city, uh, when we have what we call a 4291 stand down, which that's the public resource code 4291 that allows us to go and enforce defensible space within the state responsibility area. And, you know, we, we, we push that with the media market. Um, but I would also encourage you to, to, to friend us and then share it. And uh, you're right. We need, to, we need to be more effective in our, in our communication. Um, and people need, you know, it's great to come to an audience that wants to hear this. Uh, and we host open houses and, and many other events trying to encourage people and getting out and even fining them to the point of, of, of citations um, that they have to do it. And uh, as they experienced on kind of a microscopic level, we're de dealing on this major level of how do you get people engaged to realize. And unfortunately, the United States responds very well after a disaster. Linda. Fire Safe Marin is a community organization that's a consortium of fire agencies and the public land managers, and Mike's really involved in that. I should probably let him address this, but that's a big part of their mission. But I agree with you. I think our closer collaboration is newfound uh, about uh, getting the fire agencies and getting the land managers to have more accessible information. You're a media spe specialist, we would love uh, your ideas on how to interact more with, with the people that um, could use our help. Uh, I, I think one of the biggest obstacles for me in my own personal yard is the expense. And you know, if we, to take down trees, to do the clearing, to get rid of the debris once you've got it down, um, and FireSafe Marin is really effective at getting grants on that. Do you want to talk more about FireSafe Marin? Yeah, well, the, the, the issues, that, there's two things there. There's the resources to do work, and there's the knowledge to, you know, what needs to get done. Um, there was a huge fall off of resources. FireSafe Marin is uh, not where it was five years ago when there were federal grants and state grants yeah. all over the place for doing fuels reduction. So there's been a very large change. Um, so we're actually trying to re redefine our mission and how to best connect. So uh, Jim uh, Casper got us a grant, so we're, we've got a revitalized uh, chipper program that we're going to start rolling out. Um, and we've got some funding from, uh, thanks to Katie Rice, to, uh, to uh, augment that. So, um, you know, we're going to re-up our website and uh, become more, more visible, but we've had a, a period of... Uh, a lull, but I, I really I want to go back to I think the for for the neighborhoods because the land managers uh, are constrained about where they can put their resources. It's pretty much right up to the property line. We are very active in collaboration, but for the neighborhoods, it really is up to uh, individuals and uh, neighborhood associations to work with your local uh, fire fire district or fire department to develop community plans. And it really is up to we the Waldex are an example. It takes that kind of initiative that say, yep, I'm going to do what I can do. And that's, that's where change happens. It really, I, I, it's a remarkable story you guys have, but that's the kind of thing that Fire Safe Marine is really going to seek is find the, the people in the community that will make things happen for themselves. Christina? Well, I just really want to underscore what you said. I'm so sorry to hear that the funds have dried up because that was the whole catalyst for the success of our people spent fifteen hundred dollars on their own but it was because they heard we're getting grant money they didn't even ask us right. how much but that was the thing that and the fact that the fire 
the fire trucks were at our house in the middle of the night and then on subsequent visits and meetings and things. And they saw, I mean, you could, it was so graphic, they can't get down the street. Um, but it was the funding. And it didn't have to be a lot. Yeah. But it made all the yeah. difference. We, we've never had anywhere near the participation in this project than with others on our unincorporated lane, you know, which means we need to uh, pave our own roads. I mean, that's like, it's, it's yeah. just awful. Cool. This was so much easier because of the grant money. Mm -hmm. Kramer. Uh, just a quick question, going back to the broom issue. Um, one of the things that I couldn't believe, a few years ago, I was in a nursery and they were actually selling it. <laughs> is that, is, has that been stopped? Or, I mean, no. is it banned? I mean, the Native Plant Society spends energy every single year <clears throat> going after stores like Target and Home Depot, and they do not care. And if it makes money for them, no matter how many times they are, so they will sell it. No. Is there any, I mean, legal recourse? Legal recourse? Yeah. Okay. Can I tell a success story from my forum days, which was maybe 25 years ago? Orchard Supply was giving away broom free if you hit, bought $10 worth of anything. So I called Jean Starkweather, and she talked to some people, and they said, oh, it's a regional decision. Long story short is she got Orchard Supply to pull the broom from the whole Bay Area. They had to do it all. It was Oakland and San Jose and Marin, and they pulled it, and it was out of their store for three years. So it's just that you just got to stay on top of it. But she did it. She, it was a success for a few years. Well, I have a, I have a question about um, how wildfire um, changes the mix of competing species and whether or not um, this impacts non-native species more than um, native species or invasive species. And if there's any advantages that can be taken um, after a fire to um, reintroduce native species or to make it improve the um, <coughs> not building up of fuel. I know it releases more nutrients back into the soil, but I'm wondering if after a fire, if there's some kind of management plan in your matrix of decision making, how you deal with a post fire? I'm going to call on Michonne Martin for that. Yeah, this is so it's an interesting question. We decided it was our vegetation management plan, which is what you're referring to. Can you all hear her? They're straining. Can you, can you stand oh, up? Sorry. So we put in our vegetation management plan. We talked a lot about this, and there was so much we could put in there. When we originally wrote the vegetation management plan, it was you, you know it was huge. It, it was over 500 pages, and we realized. Okay, we need to pare down and focus on, on what we're going to accomplish here, which is where we got to the decision-making um, part of this. The, the post-fire, it is part of our, de the short answer is that it, there is in our, in our plan a, a decision. We have a, we're calling on a similar team, and I looked to Jennifer or even Linda or anyone here from the Park Service, they have what's called a BEAR team. And I don't remember what that acronym stands for, but it's what we call for in our, in our plan, where a team of scientists, ecologists, come together immediately after a fire. I was part of this team on the Mount, after the Mount Vision fire at Point Reyes. It's what, it's what funded my job there. To go in and look exactly at what you're talking about. What is the response? How do we, the, years ago, state parks, park service, um, all public lands used to just go and spread the quickest growing grass possible, which we learned, of course, later was a complete disaster because then it took over our native grasslands and we couldn't control it. So we, a lot of lessons have been learned over the past several decades with exactly this. I think it's a great question, um, and it's, it's, it's really important. We focus a lot on what can we do now to prevent everything, but again, if it happens, how could we be prepared? So we did. We wrote that in our plan, and I think everybody, Mike probably has, can say the same thing for his vegetation management plan, and I know the Park Service is sort of the poster child for describing this team that comes together that can help. Yeah. Urban area emergency response. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And, and uh, most recently, I'd stay in touch just because I'm still a national park groupie. I, uh, most recently, <laughs> the bear teams have been examining planting not exactly what burned up, but making accommodations for climate change and mm. species change so that they're planting things that will survive in the warmer weather mm -hmm. or the drier weather. So there, and people are really studying this and staying on top of it. And another thing about, that I love about the Bear Team is I was in Yosemite when the Telegraph fire hit 
And the tool that Jason talks about makes people cringe when there's something on fire, you, all bets are off on the vegetation integrity. You send bulldozers up and you get in front of that fire. And we had seven or eight bulldozers go shoulder to shoulder straight up from the Merced River to get in front of that telegraph fire because it was headed toward private property. And it put it out. And the very next day, the entire hillside was crawling with people like Michonne in her former life, mm -hmm. planting things to make sure that um, it was getting a good start. None of the bad stuff came mm -hmm. in and replaced it and, um, and kept the soils in place. So <laughs> if, if something's on fire and your house is in trouble, all, the, all bets are off. And he's got bulldozers and we're in the Bay Area, so there's a lot of resources here. You, get, you, get, you just put that fire out and then you fix it afterwards. I was on the uh, bear team for the Vis Vision Fire as an employee of the Water District, and uh, the fire was still going on, uh, but on one flank it was out, and there was rehab going on. So the dozers went from uh, the mm -hmm. top of the ridge down to the bottom on this one spur ridge, scalped it uh, behind that. Uh, while the fire was still being suppressed elsewhere, uh, excavator came and and um, you know, restored the soil profile and brought vegetation from nearby areas and basically did a gardening practice. Heavy equipment, tracked vehicle, following where the dozers went. And uh, you can't tell there was a, a fire break uh, there now. And Couldn't here's another tip. Um, don't go to Yosemite in July, but if you wanna see <laughs> maximum wildflowers, go in one month, in the middle of April to the end of May, April, and go to where the Telegraph fire burned in the Merced River Canyon. It, the next year was the most dazzling display of wildfire flowers that even the old timers had ever seen because it cleared out and gave them the opportunity that they, they didn't have to compete. And uh, uh, people that have been there for 50 years said they'd never seen anything like it. So, but uh, it really proves that fires are beneficial. I have two more quick questions and then we're gonna wrap up. You, you can go first. Hi, I'm Christopher Lang. I um, got started 45 years ago working for the City of Belvedere. They had a three-week summer work program for teenagers mm -hmm. chopping down fire and hazard shrubs in the right-of-way. And at the end of the summer, they'd pick the best people from each three-week crew and put another crew together and rent them out to homeowners mm -hmm. to chop down stuff. So Murray County has a long history of that kind of stuff. And a point the homeowner was concerned about uh, hiring people off the street as professional fuel reduction specialist for 45 years and a college graduate degree in horticulture. I have to make a point that the unlicensed labor is not a good thing. There's plenty of professionals around the county. It's a violation of the state business professions code to hire people that aren't uh, legal workers, just so you know. And so the question is, uh, I also applied to the open space fire ecologist job because I, can, I would love that job. I can sink my teeth into it. <laughs> the question is, is we look at the budget of fighting fires and, we, and brush suppression, and then we look at the budget for making the homes and the residences more fireproof in case that might be a few ideas. would be roof sprinklers. Vegetation reduction, which the local fire departments are in charge of, they can cite you, your insurance company can cancel your policy. Fireproof cladding, which is really important in Southern California when they have chaparral fires repeatedly. They make sure the side of the house is covered with stucco or fiberglass tiles or something that won't burn instead of just wood. Uh, tree service is really important. One year I was standing on West Blythe, they had looked back, I could see all the dead trees and stuff stretching all the way down the canyon. Homeowners are obligated to invest in their trees. Trees are an amenity, but if you don't invest in them, they become a liability. That's what us professional tree trimmers talk about. And the last thing is, an idea was, I talked with Hal Brown about for fire safe room, was neighborhood installations. Homeowners are willing to get out there and grab a fire hose, but if you have a swimming pool, you can have a gas powered pump that will squirt water endlessly. And you can also use special foam to cover houses over so they don't just immediately catch fire. So my question is for the panel, which is better from your perspective? Spending money on brush reduction and fighting fires or a slight refocus and focusing on actually making the homes, the dwelling units, more fireproof? Yeah, I, it goes back to the holistic approach. Um, I don't think there's a single answer that gives us the perfect end. 
Uh, you know, we've got in all of the building codes and now the wildland urban interface code, fire hardening on any new structures or any significant remodel will trigger fire hardening. So, you know, the majority of houses that catch fire are from an ember cast, not necessarily from the fire front. Um, so preparing your home, and it's more maintenance like you referred to with the trees, uh, and, and we talked about you have, you have needles collected in a gutter on a roof. Yeah. There's a greater chance the house will catch fire from that than even if you had a, a wood uh, shake siding. Um, and it's just because of the ember cast landing everywhere. It's firewood that's stacked next to a, you know, a redwood deck that's 20 years old and, and kiln dried. Um, and, and an ember lands in there and takes the, takes the house. So it's, it's more of a holistic approach. And now there's, there's systems out there that can actually identify five minutes of continuous flame and, and, and foam a house automatically from the roof. They're somewhat cost prohibitive probably for most residents. Um, but there's sprinkler systems that do the same thing. Uh, there are homeowners groups that have gotten together. Um, what we found with fire pumps and swimming pools is if the fire pumps aren't maintained oh. uh, annually and fuels in them and new fuel, they generally don't work when you need them most. Plus, it, it's uh, Australia tried a stay and defend model of residents stay at your house, try to defend it yourself. We don't have enough fire resources. So many people died during the fire siege several years ago. They withdrew that concept, and, and California was leaning in that direction. And we quickly said, no, no, no. We really need to get people out in a timely manner, early evacuations, so we can get in there and make an assessment. And really what we're going to do is we're going to look at what houses have done work that have made themselves defendable, um, and we'll support those. The others are going to be lost. Um, and we have to make that decision kind of hastily in, in a hurry. And uh, so it, it goes back to the, the, the burden is on the homeowner um, really to create the defensible space, maintain the structure, um, but we also have the challenge of an aging community here in Marin and, and with, with a lot of people on fixed incomes. How do we assist them in that annual maintenance? I don't expect to see people that are 75 years old climbing on the roof cleaning their gutters out. Um, so how do we... Yeah. Good for you. Good for you. But those are some of the challenges, so it goes back to that holistic approach. Paul <laughs> Nona. And like her on Facebook. Call me. Come on, man. Yeah. So I'm going to just wrap it up. I don't know whether this question is answerable or not, but it kind of leads us into our next seminar series, which is happening in April on land, land use and transportation planning. And I'm just wondering if any of you have an answer for how do planning for wildfires and for water supply impact Marin County's development planning and zoning, or does it? Well, you know, I think it's about time for us to leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. So I think, I think that's where we're headed, is that we would like to see more. We'd like to see this kind of collaboration and stuff, yeah. even on a broader, a broader level, affecting other um, departments and agencies within our government. So anyway, I'll leave it with that, Greg. Oh thank you. Thank you to <laughs> our... Uh, okay. Okay. All right, I just have a couple of minutes worth of stuff. Yes. I, no, I, we are running low on time, but if anybody has a minute or two response that they want to give to that, because it is a very good question, a transportation and land use question. Now, what's the interrelation with the uh, fire planning? I think Nona has an answer. Well, we, yeah, we zone to avoid Priolo, uh, Alpha Priolo uh, earthquake zone. We zone to protect people from floodplains. We do not zone people to protect them from the WUI, from the wild land urban interface, that we continue to allow houses to be built in areas of wildfire hazards. So I think it's an extremely important question, and nobody brings it up. Well, it's a tricky question because, and, and uh, what Jason was talking about is important, and that is the new homes or significant remodels are being required to be more fire re resistant. But the, the reason I made light of it is people have serious capital investments in these lots. And it, it's really hard to say you can't build here, especially if they're in an established neighborhood. So it, it, it's, a, it's a very difficult and much more personal question than asking people not to, to trim up their redwood tree 
to say to them, you can't build on this lot that mm -hmm. you're, you know. Well, we we yeah. require um, through the permitting process, a defensible space plan. Uh, we require that they have water at the site, um, that the house is sprinklered, uh, that it's fire hardened. Um, so it becomes a fire resistive home. Um, but, but you're right, it's, it's a challenge. And, and when you have a capital investment and the development within the WUI is, is pretty minimal. Um, you know, it's, but it, it, darn near everything in Marin is in the WUI too. So um, it, it goes back to the challenge we talked about earlier. Um, it, it's tough. Just, but the, the landscape plan is only for the property line, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And that's, that's the catch 22 that's sort of the problem is because those property lines are typically like 20 feet, you know, from the open space. And so there's just not even anything built into the process to say, well, what would be, I mean, of course you'd have to get the adjacent landowner participating, but you know, what would be the ideal landscaping plan here for this new construction? Don't because that's the problem is it only goes to the property line. Municipal fire marshals have the power to enforce a 100 foot defensible space on all structures. So it's up to the municipal fire marshals. As Kate said, that is a good question which leads into our next session. So hopefully I'll see many or most of you coming back to our transportation and land use planning session uh, on April 9th uh, in four weeks on a Wednesday night at the San Rafael Corporate Center. I'll just take a couple minutes and uh, mention or repeat a uh, half dozen things I've said before. First of all, I, I introduced, I think, our, our the environmental former Marin board president and former board president and some revered founders, but I forgot to introduce all the current board members who I'd like to stand up so we can thank them for all the hard work they do on putting on this series. Thank you. Also, while you're thanking people, let's thank again, not only uh, all our speakers, but the three coordinators of this, uh, Kathy Cuneo and Kate Powers and Christina Walden.